Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 124, The New Hotness, the best games of Gen Con Spring Showcase. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these shows every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you could join us. All right, so this past weekend, I attended the Gen Con Spring Showcase, and during this online convention, got to hear about all kinds of newly released and soon-to-be-released games. And during our Ask the Bellhop segment today, I'll be showcasing the games I'm most interested in playing or learning more about, the stuff I'm hyped about. Now, after that, we're going to go back to our normal format and step away from the new hotness, and we'll be reviewing a couple of cooperative card games, those being Letter Jam from CGE and The Crew from Cosmos. Now, with the con on the weekend, a big Amazon sale to hit, and lots of other things really going on, I don't really have a lot to talk about in our Week in Review segment. And Sean hasn't really done a lot of gaming either, so that's going to be a pretty short segment where we're just going to cover some online gaming and a bit of an issue I had with one of the games I received. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a positive comment on our list of styles and types of board games, Patrick, at PM Gillespie 68 on Twitter, commented, Really enjoyed your breakdown of styles, types, and definitions of gaming terminology. Nice job. Very informative. Well, thanks, Patrick. I'm glad to see people have been finding that topic and the article useful. I was really hoping it would be a good tool as useful as our list of tabletop mechanics, so I'm glad to see people appreciating it. Next up, someone who shared your thoughts on Exit, the Catacombs of Horror. TRH writes, We spent several evenings battling our way through the catacombs, gradually got into the game's way of thinking, but there's no way we could get that last clue to work in the end solution. Well, thanks, TRH. Uh, I'm glad to hear, again, this isn't the first person who's commented similar, that we weren't the only ones completely stumped by that last puzzle. Sadly, that being the last thing you do in a two-part big box set exit game just kind of sours the whole thing. Just, it's the last thing you do. And this is one of those puzzles where you give up. You're like, I have no idea how to solve this. You read the first clue and you're like, yeah, I got all the things I'm supposed to use to solve this. Then you read the second clue and you're like, well, wait, what? And then you read the final solution. Like, there is no way whatsoever we would have ever went there. We would have never noticed something you were supposed to notice and put the things together in the way they wanted you to. And I found that really disappointing. Despite enjoying most of the exit games, this is, uh, for us, the, the one big flop, really. And to be honest, when I think back on it, it wasn't that bad. It was just that that's how it ended. After two nights of play, and ours were um, days apart, getting to that, yes, we finally get to the end, and we have no idea what to do. Just wasn't fun. Well, next, we've got a comment on our Guildmaster unboxing video. Mark Bennett, nice unboxing. The divider section's out a good size for keeping the cards separate. Oh, you got it. I've only played half a game, but it's really not that heavy once you get into it. Seems really fun. Yeah, uh, Someone was obviously commenting as they watched the, the video, that which I thought was pretty amusing to say. And thanks for that, Mark. I actually appreciate it. I, I love that. I do that a lot, right? If I'm watching something on YouTube or whatever, I'll have the comment box open and kind of make notes as I'm going. Uh, sadly, I still haven't had a chance to play Guildmasters. Um, I read the rules, and it sounds rather interesting. Um, what I had no idea when I got this one is that it's a program movement game, which I'm actually a huge fan of program movement games like Wonder Woman we just talked about last week or a couple weeks back and robo rally which is still one of my favorite games of all time and i had no clue that that's what this was though i gotta say this has a lot of reading the table involved and trying to figure out where other players are going and i'm not sure on that aspect because as most people know i am not a fan of social deduction and that's getting kind of close to that type of gameplay so I, i it also has a lot more take that than i thought there are a lot of cards that are take something from someone else's guild so it just I didn't know what I was expecting, but it so far doesn't sound like it's going to be. I I am looking forward to getting it to the table and seeing how all this works together. Um, Based on everything else I played by Good Games Publishing, I'm expecting to enjoy it. So hopefully when I have some more free time, we'll get this one to the table and be talking about it on the show. 
All right, well, finally, we've got a comment about man maintaining a game group that I think Deanna, and she games our chat moderator, can relate to. Don Ball Chapman writes, Services like Roll20 and Discord have been invaluable to us this past mm -hmm. year. And funny enough, the introvert in me loves using them even more than face-to-face. -face. It's amped up my role-playing. Well, thanks, Don. Um, I'm sure you're not the only introvert loving this, the, this stay at home and everything going digital and no contact. Um, with with no, even, even with non-gaming related stuff, Deanna has loved all the contactless things we can do, right? Like delivery, people dropping stuff on the porch. You don't even have to see the delivery driver. You don't have to make contact. You don't have to hand them a tip. We can just drive to the grocery cart store and someone just puts the stuff in the back of the van, uh, phone consultations over meeting in person, all of this stuff. Uh, I'm, she has been loving it. Now, on the gaming side of things, if any group of people was prepared to sit at home and try to keep busy on their own, I got to say, gamers were probably the most prepared out of everyone out there. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, the question I'm asking the bellhop is, I know you spent a big part of this past weekend checking out all the new games announced during Gen Con Spring Spectacular. Out of all those games, what were you most excited about? All right, that's right. I did spend a number of hours on the weekend watching Gen Con TV uh, on Twitch, on their Gen Con TV Twitch channel, and all of the presentations from various publishers and board game media showcasing current and upcoming releases as well as a few games that were released last year that really didn't get the hype they deserved due to the lack of a regular con scene. That's right, folks. Unlike our usual game discussions, this week we are actually all about the new hotness. I am going to pause for one quick second. Yes, I, in the notes, wrote Gen Con Spring Spectacular everywhere, but it's actually the Gen Con Spring Showcase. Ah. But just as saying it out loud, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. So quick correction there before we get too deep into things. And I do apologize because I am working off some notes here. If I put spectacular again, it is supposed to be showcase, the Gen Con Spring Showcase. So before I get into the games I saw, I want to let everyone know what the Gen Con Spring Showcase is. Uh, this is a brand new online event that just started this year. But this is something that Gen Con plans to become a regular thing. This is something they're going to do every year in March. And the goal is to let publishers showcase the new games coming out later that year. Now, I have a strong, unconfirmed feeling that the actual goal of this is to highlight the games that will be released at Gen Con, the physical game convention later in the year. Like for Gen Con, this is a great way to get buzz going, not only for the games and the publishers, but for the con, right? Like you saw it on the Gen Con showcase. Now come to Gen Con and pick it up for yourself or do a demo or try the game. That's thoughts. I don't know if that's true. My feeling is that this year, due to the fact we don't even know if there will be a physical Gen Con, it became more of a event mainly for publishers, right? For them to highlight their new hotness whether it's releasing at Gen Con or not, or just came out this year. And it'll be interesting to me to see what if this changes, right? Assuming next year everything's back to normal, please, that if there's a regular Gen Con, if this really just becomes like the Gen Con hype show, which I really think it could be. Well, don't feel bad if you missed it. Most people did, which is why we're covering it here. We <laughs> almost missed it ourselves. All right, so what exactly was the Gen Con Spring Showcase? Now, while I called it a gaming con, and I guess that's what it is, really, because there were games and there were demos going on and stuff, but it was really more of a media event. Like, there was a web page uh, that had a product spotlight section that showed off every single game that was mentioned, how you can pre-order it, and how you can find more information with lots of pictures. And it was neat, because the way this started is there was nothing on this page if you logged in Saturday when the con started. It was after every Twitch stream ended, someone was going in there and putting in the update. So that way it wasn't spoiling anything because there were a number of games announced for the first time during this con. So it was kind of cool to watch that section of the webpage grow. 
And I got to say, it was invaluable to me to go back to to remember some of the games that were talked about before I realized, hey, I want to take notes on this because I think this will be a cool podcast topic. Now, the live streams are what I actually took part in. Um, each live stream was 50 minutes long. They were a mix of publishers showing off their games. So you would have like a, a rep from Pandasaurus or Renegade Games there or board game media doing things um, like actual plays. There was a group called Hyper RPG that did a bunch of live unboxings on stream. Um, there were just some media folk just talking about the games they're excited about and what they're hyped about. Now, along with all this, there was the usual Discord server, which has, as of about March last year, I'm not sure when the first one was, Renegade Con's the first one I attended, but uh, Discord-based social gatherings at online conventions is definitely a thing now. Every online client has greatly taken advantage of the use of Discord, and there was one of these for this. Um, at, in the Discord, you could actually demo a number of the games. Uh, they were all on Tabletopia, from what I understand, um, which is free to use. So if you were there, you could go into a demo room and you could sign up and actually try a number of these games. Plus, it was Discord, so it was a chat room. So it was a place to hook up with other gamers and hang out and talk and talk about the games you like and so on. The flexibility and ease of setup and teardown of Discord servers, as well as an evolving but powerful permission system, really makes Discord, for all of its flaws, a great platform for this kind of uh, event. Yeah, my only problem with Discord is I'm on so many servers and there's no way to keep up. And I would have a real hard time if I did have Discord open to remember to just stay in the Gen Con spot. That's, that's the only disadvantage I find with Gen Con. And especially with the, it's ending up that there have been multiples of these cons on the same weekends. I don't know if there was anything but Gen Con this weekend, but trying to keep track of everything becomes overwhelming. And I think all you have to do is put yourself in the headspace that you're at a con and manage your time appropriately. Like, I am going to go spend an hour on the Discord and see what people are saying about this game I'm curious about. And then I'm going to go to a panel, a, a Twitch channel, and watch that and close the other window. All right, based on the overall farm format and the way it worked, uh, like I gotta say, in the last year, companies have really nailed down this online con format and it was working great. Like the, the Twitch stream was flawless, except for like one person had an audio issue and they were doing great things with transitions to switch from showcasing the people talking to showcasing pictures of the board games and video showing the components. Like It was just much better produced than any of the other online cons I've seen. And I, I'm certain this will happen again next year, what, whether there's a Gen Con or not, a physical Gen Con. I think this was a great way to drum up buzz about the new hotness. And to be honest, look, like we're the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. We are almost never about the new hotness. And here we are talking about it. So I, it must have worked somewhat, right? Yep. So sit back and enjoy a brief and rare foray into <laughs> hot new games. All right. So just quick. Before I get to the actual games, just overall, I had a good time. Um, it was a, a pleasant experience. I got to learn about all kinds of stuff. But what I really appreciated the most was the fact that most of the streams were excellent uh, with interacting with the chat. And that's not something you would get at a panel, at a con. Like, they may have a Q&A period at the end. But even more so, like, the kind of announcements we were talking about here is more like attending a keynote. And keynotes aren't really interactive. It's you sit back and hear about the new stuff. And I think this was really cool because you got to ask questions about these games. Like, hey, what age group? Or you said that it's this, this, and this, but what happens in a tie? And what do you do if you're doing this? Like one of the games that was showcased, they played the cooperative mode. So I had all kinds of questions about the competitive mode, which they weren't talking about. They were playing the cooperative and they mentioned it competitively. And I'm like, I think I'd rather play this competitively. Can you tell me more? And I was getting, in, well, near instant feedback, as much as instant feedback as you get on Twitch, which was awesome. All right, well, enough about what the Gen Con Spring Showcase is. We want to know what games you learned about that got you excited. Now, this list is in the order they were presented over the weekend and aren't mm. ranked in any way. Also, this is only a small sampling of the games that were showcased this weekend. For a full list, head over to www.genconspringshowcase.com. In addition, you can head to the Gen Con official YouTube channel where they have VOD versions of every single one of the panels from the weekend. 
Yeah, I actually really appreciate that last part because I found out about the event a little late, so I missed a few, and I was able to watch them after the fact, so that was cool. All right, so I'm going to start off with a new series of games coming from Haba. Now, when I say Haba, everyone thinks Yellow Box Kids games. No, these are from their their Game Night Games series, which we piloted a few on the show, like um, Roll For It is one of them. Or no, not Roll For It, the King one. Oh, I forget the name of it. That's terrible. Wow, I am drawing a complete blank. I can picture it. And it's a dice rolling game that's similar to Roll For It, and it's fantasy-themed. Oh, I'm terrible. I'm sorry, Haba. No, no, no. <laughs> this, is, like, this is dice what is the title? name of that game. I have no idea. King of the Dice. That was without actually Googling. King of the Dice. My bad for totally blanking out on the name of that game. Adventureland is a much more well-known Haba game that's in that series. So anyway, this new game is um, cashing in on the, the, the whole escape room puzzle deduction style games. And it's called The Key is the series. And there's three games in the key series. Uh, the f- one that they did a live play of, um, it was um, Raul Aviola and his wife who played it. Um, they were playing a game called The Key, Sabotage at Lucky Llama Land. So this is a theme park themed game where some kind of crime has been committed. All these games are trying to solve a crime. Um, The first two games are more family-friendly. There's this one. I can't remember what the second one was. The third one that's not out yet actually is Solving a Murder, so that one's more for adults. This one's definitely more kid-friendly. And you are at a theme park called Lucky Llama Land with all rides themed after llamas. Three hooligans have sabotaged three of the rides at the theme park. Now, this happened over three days. And each of the hooligans used a different set of tools. And you need to use the clues provided in the game to figure out who sabotaged what ride on what day with what tool. And there are nine different possible cases to solve in this. But because of the way the clue system works, you could actually replay this. There's no reason. Like, solving one doesn't mean that it's going to be the same every time. So it, But you may, if you remember the final number, you're going to get the same answer. But how you get to that answer would be different. So I don't know. That was one of the things I questioned them while playing is how replayable is it? And they were really pushing that, yeah, it's a, it's a replayable. I don't know. That's, that's one I'd have to try. So this game is a mess. You put a key in the middle of the table, and then you scatter the cards over your whole table, using up as much space as you can so that people can see as many cards as once. Each of these cards is a clue to how to solve it. And they have a grid of colors on the back that shows which of the nine cases they apply to. Now, they actually tell you to keep all the cards on the table, even if there's clues that don't apply to your case, because part of this game is a race to solve it first. And if people grab the wrong clues, it can send them on a wild goose chase. So when you grab a clue, you're going to flip it over and it's going to tell you some information. There's all kinds of different things here. So one of the coolest ones I like is with the game, you get a map of Lucky Llama Land. But man, did I get Bob Lowe flashbacks looking at this map. Like it looks like that 1980s hand-drawn cartoony theme park map. And what the selfies do is the person holding the weapon, of course, had to take a picture of of some other people. So you know what ride they're at, but you have to deduce it by looking at the selfie they've got to see where they were standing in the park. So you sit there and you look at it and you're like, oh, there's a roller coaster in the background and I can see the drop ride. So they must have been standing over here by the log ride, which I thought that was kind of neat. I've never seen that in a deduction game before. Um, There's also eyewitness reports that are just basically give you some kind of information like, oh, I saw this person on this day. Another one I thought was brilliant was ticket sale records. So you could figure out what tickets one of the people bought. And then by putting together what tickets they bought, you can figure out what day they were at the park. Because, and then with that, there was another one that had info on the maintenance schedule for the rides. So at certain points, certain rides were closed. So again, you'd use deduction to go, well, she was on the park at Thursday and she went on this and this, and she had tickets for this and this ride and this ride was closed. So therefore it's gotta be this person. Now, the neat part about all this is the base game is competitive. Everyone is trying to solve the mystery at once. And you're grabbing these cards off the table that are spread everywhere. You're looking at the clue and you're using your own little personal thing and a dry erase marker to circle who you think it is. And then eventually you're like, I got it. And then you do this thing where there's a two-sided board and you stick the key in it. 
you don't actually turn it and then you flip it over and if the keys this matches the color of the tag you've got the right person or you can play the entire game cooperatively where you're all working together to solve it and you get a score based on the numbers that are on the clues based on how good or bad they are i just it was a really neat different take on deduction like nothing like i was kind of blown away the same way i was blown away by chronicles of crime 1400 by doing something completely different and this did that my concern though is that replayability I, though nine cases is a lot like nine plays out of a modern board game nowadays who plays their games nine times except for those big hits i, I gotta say nine plays isn't bad uh what i didn't know here is what the msrp is but i remember thinking it was very reasonable 29.99 msrp for nine plays yeah a minimum of a game that's got a lot of components the components look at least reasonably solid the yep. art is very friendly mm -hmm. and uh from what i from a quick glance i can't i can't tell for sure but it seems very open and inclusive uh in the artwork yep. and you know what i think that's probably a good deal right now uh the key sabotage of lucky llama land is uh available and the other one that is currently available is uh uh murder at the oakdale club is the other one see that's that one's not right supposed now. to be released yet that should be a oh is a pre-order pre maybe that that's probably they nope. said the murder one wasn't out yet right now okay, there were two family friendly ones it's it's showing it's showing available on their website so well maybe they <laughs> meant later like five days three days possibly. from now <laughs> um, which is possible but but yeah so oh deanna is saying it's out in europe but not over here oh i'm, I'm so, a habit usa.com and it says and it says huh? add to cart so i don't know uh, it is it is highly possible yeah. um that it wasn't available on Saturday, but it is now because I was seeing that during the whole con, to be honest. Could be. I'm, I'm also concerned. Uh, I mean, I, I think I love logic puzzles always have as a kid. So I think that that's a fun aspect and a, and yep. a more interesting aspect than some of the um, less strictly logic puzzle based uh, yeah. mystery games. Uh, but also llamas. What is with llamas? There, I mean, you get llamas in everything these days. No, that, that's know. the new pirates, the new zombies, yeah, the I new guess. Mars. Well, that was that was the key. Some sabotage at Lucky Llama Land. All right. Next up, I have a game from the Op. Uh, we feature them many times on our blog and site and podcast. And the game is the Batman Who Laughs Rising. And I got to say, when I first saw this game online, I thought it was the Batman Who Laughs Rising. And I didn't get it. But I guess it's the Batman Who Laughs, which is some super dark DC comic run from the DC Metal Universe where the Joker becomes the Batman. Sorry, the Batman Who Laughs, which fits, I guess. Um, so it's the Batman Who Laughs Rising. Now, this is a follow-up to the rest of the Rising series. Uh, Thanos Rising and Voldemort Rising or Dark Eaters Rising. I can't remember what that one's called. There's a Rising, number of yeah. these Rising games. And I got to admit, I've never played any of them myself. They, ne they never really caught my interest. From what I understand, they're fairly light. But watching the Hyper RPG team unbox this game, I got to say I'm tempted to pick it up just by the look of this game. Like, you have this Batman Who Laughs statue that would just look great on the game shelf back here like it, it, as a display piece it just looked really cool and then the components are really neat uh they have some of the most detailed engraved custom dice i've seen like these are really engraved like not not just the it's it's the opposite it's the the logos are standing up and everything around them is engraved instead mm -hmm. of just etching in the letters and numbers and stuff. And they're dice with all the DC logo, DC logo, right? They got a Wonder Woman die with the Wonder Woman logo and a Green Lantern die with the Green Lantern symbol and the super soup symbol and all that. I, it just looks really cool. Now, I got to admit, I don't know enough about these games. So this is one I'm definitely looking forward to hearing more reviews about and consider picking up sometime in the future. I'm, I'm just, I couldn't believe how good this game looked. I'm like, man, that is a, it's just table presence. Looks sweet. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we should note that this is, this game is listed for 15 plus. Yeah. It is dark material. This is not your, you know, little kids Batman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, whoever thought punctuation on Batman <laughs> would be important. That's, uh, <laughs> I, I have to question how long they can keep pumping out these rising games. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a re-implementation of Thanos rising, which, and they've already had, you know, the Harry Potter re-implementation of Thanos rising. At some point, mm -hmm. the people who are interested in the rising game 
are going to have at least one copy already. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I you, you know what? That some of these series just got to take off and keep going, right? The, how many villainous games there are now? Like, there's a whole ton of villainous Disney. They just released a new Disney but isn't villainous is all one game, just different villains? <clears throat> no, because now they've released Marvel villainous. Oh, okay. I thought, see, I thought it was, all, it was one game. And, and, oh no, there's oh, it's okay. it's similar. They've and this is not the op. This is a different company doing it. Or another example is the um, Dominion, right? Like you just, but they, like you said, Dominion is all one game. There aren't right. other versions of Dominion. But then there's Clank and Clank in Space. Like it's not uncommon to see this. And like to be honest, one of the games that wasn't on my list to talk about was another Rising game, <laughs> and that's the one they did the actual play. So they they unboxed the Batman Who Laughs Rising, but they played a SpongeBob Rising game called Plankton Rising which I plankton, I guess, is the villain in SpongeBob. I don't know. Sure. And they were doing things to like build burgers. And if they failed at building their burgers on time, uh, people were getting upset. I don't know. I, I, it wasn't something I was interested in, but I got to say that people on the stream seemed to really dig it. They, they were laughing their butts off. So, well, you know, SpongeBob fans will SpongeBob. <laughs> and that was bat, the Batman who laughs rising. That's still weird. The Batman who laughs. I don't know. Because I, I was trying to, I'm like, what does Who Laughs Rising mean? All right. Also, from the op, USA Opoly, I want to talk a bit about Hughes and Cues. This is such a simple concept that I've already had some buzz about. Like, I, I already thought it sounded pretty cool, but I actually got to see it in action. And it worked so well. This is a color-based game where one player gets a card with four colors on it. And they pick one that's going to be their target for this game. Then they give a one word clue, one word only. So think uh, like uh, code names. And then the board is a huge grid showing the entire color spectrum. Now the other players are going to put a token on the spot. They think that matches the clue. So if you say Apple, you're probably going to put it somewhere red or maybe not. Maybe you put it on yellow because you were thinking Matsu or something, but that's why Apple is probably not the best clue, <laughs> but then the clue giver can give out a two-word clue, and they get to place a second token. So maybe you said Apple the first time, they're like, oh, yeah, I never thought of Matsu, so I am going to say Macintosh tree. And then people are like, oh, okay, but then someone's thinking tree, and they put it on brown. Wherever they place their things, the player who gave out the clue puts this box out around the right number. And based on where the pawns are in relation to that box, players are going to score points. And they have to be close. They have to be like inside it, on the inside edge, or on the outside edge to score points. Otherwise, it's not worth anything. This is just, what a brilliant design. Like, it's just so smart. I'm like, wow, that is just such a cool concept for a game. This is one I'm going to be contacting my contact at the op to see if we can get a copy of. Well, you know what? I'm interested in this one just to see if my color theory knowledge from <laughs> art and photography ever actually sank in. Uh, I would actually love to see Pantone jump in with a branded mm. version of this, which would be a blast for graphic designers to play. And I'm sure they would be all over it. My only concern, like you being able to play it, the problem is you'd need other people with the same level of experience for that to actually work. Possibly. Although it could just be, a, you know, one person has the advantage of being able to give better clues or, or get clues better. Yeah. You know, I'd be interesting to see, though. That's, that's it would. part of it. Interesting. And that was Hughes and Cues from the Op. All right. The next one I've got is something I had no clue about whatsoever. Um, this is Epic Encounters from a company called Steam Forge Games, who do a lot of RPG work. Uh, this is a box set that's basically a D, &D fifth adventure edition encounter in a box that features 20 miniatures that wow like these these are minis like like, like maxis in a way like these are nice these are really nice they don't look they have a unique style, a unique flair to them. I think there's a little bit of an anime aspect to some of these. Uh, note this company actually does have the license to do the Monster Hunter game. So that was another one they showcased, but not one I was going to highlight here. So I don't know. These, these really kick butt looking miniatures. And you get 20 of them. You get a two-sided battle mat. And then you get an adventure. And the adventure is set so that like one of the questions that got asked and the, one of the newest adventures is a hydra based one and they're like well hydra you're not going to put a first level party up against a hydra and they're like but wait we have it set up so that this is set up for three tiers of play 
and you can play a level five or a level 15 or a level 30. I'm making these numbers up, whatever they happen to be, but they're the heroic exploration or epic level of play. And there's a counters that use the miniatures designed for all of them. And they pointed out and then the Hydra at the low level play, you're going to see the Hydra. It's good. You're going to get to put the mini out and scare the heck out of the players, but then it's going to back off while its minions rush forward to stop the heroes as it escapes so that they can face it later, which is actually a really good adventure design. And I, I got to say, these are 50 bucks each. $50 for 20 great looking miniatures and a flip mat is a good deal to me. As someone who likes to play D&D with maps and minis, that's a good price. And to me, the adventure is a bonus. Like, hey, you also give me three adventures to run with these things. And now, how many different epic adventures are there? Because I know epic adventures isn't, you, you can't buy epic adventures. You can buy epic adventures, the Hydra, or epic adventures, yep. the Kobold, Kobolds. I think there were three out and they just announced two more. I'd, okay. I'd have to look it up. So what these are is these are actually a third party product for fifth edition D and D. This is not a standalone thing. You are not getting to play Epic adventures. You are buying Epic adventures for your D and D game using that terminology. So this is not like a, a box set that you'll be able to use on your own. Now, of course you could buy it and paint the miniatures up and use them for wherever and use the maps, but there is no Epic adventures game. These are supplements for the world's most popular role-playing game, I think is the proper way to word it nowadays instead of using its brand name. Gotcha. And that was Epic Encounters from Steamforged Games. All right, next I've got a game from Calliope Games. Now, this is one and that is back in print. So it's ship shape. It came out and blew up. The, the podcasters I listen to love this. And it went out of stock quick. Like Calliope definitely grossly underestimated the popularity of this game. So this was a case where Calliope was on this Gen Con showcase, not promoting a new game, but rather promoting a reprint saying, hey, everyone, ship shapes back in stock. Now, I got to say, I when I first heard about this game, it sounded cool. And I got to watch an actual play. Now, this was on Tabletopia, so I didn't get to see the actual components, but it was a really well-done simulation on Tabletopia, so it looked really good. So what you've got is a, it's, it's a drafting game. You all have ships, pirate ships, ship holds, and there's a hold there with a three-by-three three grid on it, and everyone's starting ship is going to have three rats on it, and those are negative points if you still got them in your hold by the end of the game. Now, each round, you're bidding to draft hold tiles, which are in a stack, in the center of the tile table now these are also a 3d by 3 grid but like they're it has holes i don't know how to describe it with hold, holding one up and i don't have one here but it, it's it's a three by three grid with lots of holes in it that are only covering parts of that and if you look at the stack from above you can see stuff below right like you you, you don't just see the top style you can kind of see what's in the next couple cards and like you might even see all the way down to the bottom and be like wow there's nothing in the top left corner so you're bidding, and part of the strategy here is trying to figure out, do you want to go first to get the top card, or maybe you actually want the third card because you can see it has the right thing on it. Now, these all feature gold, cannons, and or contraband. And what you're going to do is you bid your bid, then you're going to get your thing, and then you get to place it on your hold, on your shipboard. And you can flip it, rotate it, turn it, literally any way, and it's two-sided. So you've got any possible orientation, and you're going to try to put it on your ship, and then draft more and put that on your ship and put that on your ship. And eventually you get your completed hole where you look down at your ship and see what you can get. Now, you hopefully have covered up all your rats. Uh, you just get straight up points for the amount of gold you have. Now, cannons don't score points, but the person with the lowest is penalized. If I remember, they, their gold doesn't count or something like that. And then if I remember correctly, again, I, I was watching a bunch of live streams. Contraband is one of those who has the most contraband get something and who has the least might get punished. So it sounds super simple, and it really is. But there's more to it than that. And the part that I didn't know about this game that makes me much more interested in picking it up is that the tiles you draft have that thing where you can see through, and every tile adds up to eight on those three things. So if you see a tile with eight gold showing, you know there's nothing else on that tile. Whereas if you see a tile with three gold, you know there's five more cannons or five more contraband or a combination of the boat. And I think that really adds a level of strategy to what sounds like a really basic game. This looks like one of those games that's dead simple to teach, right? Like here, draft, you're going to place a place on your thing. 
but then you're going to have those aha moments where you're like, oh, wait, but I want to do this. Oh, wait. And, and then I want to watch their hold to see, oh, they're collecting cannons. Like, it just seems like one of those simple to learn, hard to master games, which is always a winning combination. Now, I'm guessing we got to be careful. It's not the Romper Room, my first game version of Ship Shape, which is two words, Ship Shape. The game okay. you're looking for if you're popping on to board, to board Game Geek is Ship Shape, one word. Okay. <laughs> Very different games there. Uh, see, I See, this one's sort of interesting to me, but again, I'm not a huge bluffing fan. And, and there is that aspect of it to this game. So, I, you know, I definitely have to, to try before buying on this one for me. But that is Ship Shape from Calliope Games. All right, up next, I got another Calliope game, one that I had no idea was coming from one of the biggest names in board gaming. This is a tile laying game called Ancestry. This is from Eric Lang, like uh, the, the, the man behind... Uh, blood rage and and uh rising sun right like you don't think of a light tile laying game as being an eric lang game nowadays that name alone made me pay attention i gotta say i'm like holy cow this is it, it looks really sweet so this is a filler 20 minute tile drafting game where you're drafting members of a family and there's all kinds again very diverse artwork showing different people and on them there are possible connections above and below them and you're going to draft the tile and you're going to put it down and then you're building either a lineage by placing things in a row going down or you can place the tile side by side assuming the right connectors there to create a marriage there's a scoring every round to see who has the longest lineage in each of the different families which are represented by player colors as well as symbology to help with any color blindness issues there's also a fibonacci based end game scoring for marriages so like one marriage is worth one two marriages is worth three uh four marriages is worth seven you know fibonacci series where you add the previous number to the one you already had so there's that aspect of it um, you play through three rounds, and every round you're going to score those lineages. So it's one of those you might only get a couple points the first round, but by the third, you hopefully have all these lineages. There's also an aspect of who has the most of each color. A lot of interesting things going on. Uh, artwork by Larry Elmore, who any Dungeons & Dragons fan, fantasy fan should know that name. Uh, just really neat looking filler game. Now, this one is interesting. This actually does look like my style of fun filler. Um, it's, it's very... Um... Seven Wonders esque almost, uh, with the yep. with the pass and uh, pass drafting uh, set up and you're you know laying down in front of you. Uh, interestingly, this isn't a new game though. See, they didn't even have physical copies. This game, so is, is it a reprint? This I I don't know, but this game is from 2017, and there are reviews going all the way back to 2017, available on Board Game Geek. So was it published in Europe? Well, it's well, the first I'm time in North America. Well, I'm interested in it. I'm. Uh, not quite sure what i mean i've got united states reviews from 2017 so Weird. maybe th maybe this is a reprint or something but uh somehow this isn't actually anywhere near as new as some of the things that we uh, yeah that's odd i wonder i wonder why i didn't, they... I didn't even notice this the first time when i was when i was checking for no on the notes but uh, I there's at almost no and... pictures too which is really weird. yeah but i mean like, it's, it's like got a number now, of reviews but not that many really for heck it was a 2018 mensa recommended game yeah <laughs> there is an official english page which does make me think that maybe it was uh and i do see english edition mentioned a couple times right. so it must have been in another language but yeah like the dice tower reviewed this three years ago yeah all right see i, I lied i said <laughs> we're going to be all about the new hotness and it ends up that the spring spectacular it's, tricked yeah. me <laughs> it made me think these are the new hotness, but they're actually not. But that was Ancestry <laughs> from Calliope Games. All right, fair enough. All right, these ones are supposedly brand new and hot. All right, I, I promise you on this one. Uh, the next uh, panel I attended was the IGDN panel, which is the Indie Game Developers Network. Um, I don't have a lot to say about specific games here. They showcased a bunch of great looking indie RPGs, uh, Aloy, uh, third. Third Eye Games put out a new part-time gods expansion, which I was just cool to see that system still running. Uh, that's an RPG where you play gods of uh, mundane things. 
So you could be like the, the, the god of the mall security, or you could be the god of always finding a quarter in your pocket, or I, I don't know, people have come up with really interesting ones. So that, that's cool to see a new expansion for that. Um, there was this huge hardcover OSR book that looked as thick as Dungeon Crawl Classics called The Maze that I got to say looked really neat. And supposedly it was a uh, drop it into your favorite world's most popular game. Uh, but OSR version, old version, right? Uh, this looked really neat, great artwork and so on. Um, Capers caught my eye as something I didn't hadn't personally heard about, uh, mainly as something I thought Sean would like. This is a 1920 superhero RPG, but you're not playing the supers. You're not playing the cops. You're not playing the feds. You're playing the gangsters. So it's, it's not a superhero RPG. It's a supers RPG where the gangsters have the powers, which I thought that was a really unique twist. Uh, but the most interesting thing, and what I really wanted to highlight here that I think is important for everyone to know, is that the IGDN up until this point has always been RPGs. That's, they, they were an RPG publishing company, expect, despite saying Indie Game Developers Network. And if you like went to their booth at Gen Con or Origins, which is where I've seen them, it was some of the best indie RPGs I've ever seen. Like it, it was, it was, a, it was a one-stop shop, and I picked up Worldwide Wrestling there. I've seen Iron Edda there. I, the Hydro Hackers. They had the um, uh, what's uh, the ash can there at one time like great stuff i i've spent a lot of money at the id gn booth but it was always rpgs so what they did say is they are branching out so they're broadening their definition of games to include other forms of tabletop uh this includes miniature games and board games now one of the games they did feature that was non-rpg was a game called gangs of the undercity which i i gotta say it kind of reminds me of um what is it called? Necromunda from Warhammer 40k. So I, I don't know how similar they were, but you play street punks in this undercity that's like the 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 depths of the underneath all the, the big city above and gangs battle it out. Now this did look lower tech than the Warhammer 40k game, but did have a similar aesthetic of the, the kind of punk aesthetic and everyone controls their own gang. Uh, the presenters for the show, I'm sorry I didn't catch their names, were very excited by this game like uh, not even the like not the people from the company but the, the podcasters that were helping out or twitch streamers i'm not sure which they were they weren't people i recognized uh were super excited about the gangs of the undercity the big thing here though like the, the fact the igdn is branching out i think is great news like if you publish board games you should get a hold of them this is a company that it's a nonprofit that is there to help you get your game developed and published and their entire mission statement is we want to be there for you until you don't need us anymore, which I think is fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, no, Capers, I was aware of uh, due to its Kickstarter. Oh, so it's, it's coming out into real production now. Mm. But uh, I, I, had, I had sort of kept a track of that when, uh, when the Kickstarter was live. And it was interesting, and I kept, I kept leaning towards it and, and looking at it. But I, the real interest, for the, the, or the real sort of buzzkill for me is, is this setting. I, mm -hmm. I just don't have enough interest in the, the 20s gangster era to to feel an urge and uh we'll learn another day about how many other supers games <laughs> i already have <laughs> so that was a number of games from the indie game developer network all right next up i have renegade game studios uh the they they had a exceedingly detailed felt long but they're all 50 minutes but it's basically a presentation on all the new stuff they have coming and there was a lot of it so this is just uh, the, one of the things that stuck out. Actually, a couple I've got. And the one is the Snallygaster Situation, a Kids on Bikes board game. Now, this is obviously based on the very popular Kids on Bikes RPG, which is from Renegade, which is based on Stranger Things. Specifically, that aspect of Kids on Bikes where one of the kids is powered. And that's what makes it stick out from, say, Tales from the Loop and other Kids on Bikes games. In the RPG... All of the players together control the powered, and that same thing happens in this board game. Now, unfortunately, that's about all I can tell you. Uh, they didn't really share a lot of info on this. Um, I just, I did kids on bikes. I was a fan of Stranger Things. I never thought that tapping into my 80s nostalgia in a role-playing game would turn out to be something I enjoy. But man, I have. I have enjoyed it way more than I ever thought I would. Uh, despite not really being happy with the way my childhood went, nothing much I can do about it now. But I guess experiencing a better childhood has been worth it. Uh, this looks neat. 
it looks cool. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more. I, I don't really have enough to, I, I can't sell you on this one because I don't know enough, but it just looked cool. And I love the fact that there is going to be a kids on the bikes board game. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, there's, there's no other than the box art. There's nothing yeah. really out there yet. Uh, it's described as a cooperative deduction, hidden movement, team-based game. <laughs> um, so apparently you need to find the powered and then go and find a cryptid yep. somewhere uh there a lot of the description feels a lot like horrified um okay. the way they've described it seemed that like that just mm -hmm. the first game that came to mind was that yeah i i i could see that i got that vibe so now now what they did show was the box cover but then they showed pictures of the cryptids but all they showed was a picture of the cryptid and it said like difficulty three stars and difficulty five stars. So that didn't really tell me anything except that there were multiple cryptids at different difficulty levels. Right. I don't know. I, I want to know more. This one looks good. And that was the Snallygaster situation, a kids on bikes board game from Renegade Game Studios. And I will never say those words together in a line again, probably. <laughs> Until we uh, review it. Right. And <laughs> then you'll have to say it. All right, also from Renegades, uh, they showcase something I think is really cool, something I was actually involved in. Uh, they showcase the new edition of Gravwell. I was a playtester on this new edition of Gravwell. Uh, this is a great update to the classic game that adds a few things. One of them, the ability to play with six players. So the original was four player only, where your four ships are trying to escape the Gravwell. But once you get up to six players, and actually once you have five or six players, some ships are trying to get to the middle and some are trying to get out. And if you've played Gravel, you know what that means. Like, like Gravel is all about what ships are closer to try to position and trying to figure out what cards other people and remember what cards they drafted so that you go in the direction you want, which is difficult because of the gravity rules. Well, like I said, the difference is now you have ships going the other way, which just kind of makes things so much more interesting. The other thing they did was they added uh, symmetric ship powers. Every ship has four powers now. And they're all unique. So everyone not only has an emergency stop, but you have different asymmetric powers. And while everyone knows who listens to this podcast, watches this show, I love asymmetry. So adding asymmetry to Gravwell is a big win for me. Juicy asymmetry is always fun. And that was Gravwell 2nd Edition, also from Renegade Game Studios. All right, next, I have a really different game doing something totally new in the world of mashing up board games and role-playing games this is keepers of the quest star from upper deck entertainment uh the company that brought you marvel legendary for example this is like a two-player only role-playing game or player versus player dming so each player is running an encounter for the other player and then they have a dm screen in front of them and they have a map behind it and on that map, before they start play, they're going to place monsters, traps, treasure, a starting point, exit, and all these tokens. This is the map the other player is going to be exploring. Now, in general, the goal is to explore the map, starting from the entrance, trying to find the quest star, which is this mythic thing they've came up with for this, the setting, and escape. But there are other variations. Uh, the version I saw was just a quest for the quest star. Run in, grab the quest star, and get out. Now, each turn players get action points, kind of like, say, XCOM or something like that, or even Pandemic, where you like you get four points and one point to move a square, another point you can explore a square. So if there's something there, you know whether you're going to encounter it, or if you don't explore, it's just blind. Like if you move into a square and run into something, it happens. Um, and as they explore, the other player tells them what happens. So it's like, okay, I move left, or I move to E6. And then the other player says, all right, you head down the corridor and you don't see anything. Or you head down the corridor and all of a sudden you find a bubbling brook of magic water. What do you do? Right? That kind of thing. Uh, if you run into a monster, monsters are at three different levels. And combat is, is the simplest I think I've ever seen in a role-playing game to keep it flowing. And all this is, is the monsters. Uh, a level one monster has four. And you take these four chits that are number one to four. And then the other player guesses a number from one to four. And if they get the number, they kill the monster. If they don't, they take a damage. And then they do go again. And while if they failed on the first time, now it's out of three and then it's out of two and then it's out of one. So you're eventually going to kill the monster. I thought that was kind of a unique combat system. No dice rolls. So people like there's no randomness there. I, it was different. Um, now, there are some story prompts to this game 
but it's actually meant to be an improv RPG experience. You're meant to be storytelling. So when you're building that dungeon in front of you, you're actually supposed to be coming up with a story of what's going on. So for example, the monsters literally say level one, two, and three. It doesn't tell you what they are. But like when you're playing, you can be like, well, my level ones are monsters and my level twos are, are orcs and my level threes are ogres. And the, the building you're going in is an abandoned keep and these monsters have moved in because they can feel the power of the quest are or something. Now they do give some prompts for people who aren't used to full improv, but this is definitely seems like something that's designed for people who know what role-playing is, right? This is, to me, this seems like the game you play on RPG night when the other players cancel and there's only two of you left. So you're like, well, let's play some quest art because we can't play D&D &D tonight. I, I thought this was really neat. The other thing I really liked was the aesthetic. This has a very Thundar the Barbarian, early He-Man, early cartoon fantasy look to it that I, I thought was cool. Even the name Questar just kind of feels that, uh, that, that uh, what was it, Black Star? You know, all of, the, all of those early 80s cartoons. Chris Star. Chris Star, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, and it looks like it's very competitive. Like, it's really, uh, you know, you're, you're both trying to escape your own dungeon, but you're trying to make sure the other guy doesn't. Yes. Uh, is, the, is the feel I was really getting out of it. Yeah, the one thing that, that you may not have realized by that description, I might have I might have glossed over, is that you're actually playing like two different games at once, right? Like your two adventuring groups aren't ever going to, you're not in the same dungeon. It's it's two concurrent role-playing games being run at once, right? You, you, they don't interact. I'm running a dungeon for you, and you're running a dungeon for me, and it just happens to be at the same time. So which I, th I thought just, I don't know, it's different, right? Like I've never seen anything quite like this. It's 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 literally competitive dungeon crawling which i i think is really neat looking and interestingly there is no board game geek page for this i swear i was on it i but I, I, I can find an amazon page for it but huh. not a board game geek page and i've been odd. i've been punching in a whole lot of search terms trying to find it so all right maybe it's not this but, one i don't think is out yet right. like this this was yeah. coming soon yeah no it, it's not it, it's listed there but it's not actually available yet on uh yeah, I Amazon. saw it on Amazon, and it was like some third-party seller who like probably instantly made a listing as soon as the game was announced. Yeah, but yeah, the, like Upper Deck has a, a a page for it now, but it's not available. It's just yeah. There. Uh, and that was Keepers of the Quest Star from Upper Deck. All right, next up is a company I've never heard of before, Korea Board Games. They showcased a couple of games, and uh, basically kids lighter games. But do, both doing something kind of cool. The, the first was Monster Dentist. This, this is definitely a kid's game. It's like a little kid's game. You put the, the game between the players, and it's two-sided with two monster heads with wide open mouths. And between these, you stack the cards, which show a number of teeth in different colors, some of which have cavities. So just because it's a red tooth, it, it, it would be a red tooth that's healthier, or a red tooth with cavities, for example. Now, all these cards are placed face down. You can't see them. Now, while playing, the players are going to look into the mouths of the monsters and insert a dentist mirror, right? Like the kind the dentists use with a little tiny mirror on it and put it kind of like in and under the box is the way it works. And what it lets you do is see the bottom of that stack of cards. And now these are small mirrors, so you don't get to see much and there's not a lot of wiggle room. So it's not like you can really zoom out. You can only really see one or part of a tooth at once. And you're going to kind of use your mirror to figure out what color teeth the monster have and how many of them have cavities. And you're going to mark that with this like board in front of you showing which teeth they're wearing and which are cavities. And the first player to, to get all the guesses ready, just go stop or whatever. We're ready. And maybe there's a specific term you're supposed to say. And then you're going to pull the bottom card off the deck and see if you're right. Now, if you're right, you get to keep the card, and the first player of the three cards wins. But if you're wrong, you not only don't get the card you just should have won, you lose one you previously won. And the whole game is played to first of three. Like, dead simple, but neat. Like, I, I've never seen anything that quote uses mirrors this way. And specifically, the having a stack of cards face down and using a mirror to see the bottom card just seems like something that could be used in some kind of heavier game, like something with multi-use cards or something like, like, you know how Bruges, you can see the top two colors of the cards, but like some way to put a mirror under the Bruges deck to see the bottom <laughs> card. I, I just seems like you could do more with this. Yeah. It's an interesting mechanic with the use of mirrors. Absolutely. I'm just not sold. It would get a lot of replay value yeah. from, the, from the kids I know. Uh, and a quick look at uh, careerboardgames.com indicates they have this 
strange selection of uh, games that probably all have some interesting concepts, but aren't necessarily fully rounded out. Uh, so it, they, they, and then they've even got like some taking submissions is a big part of their website. Oh, so okay. I think they're 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 sort so of a looking um, for new stuff. Yeah, they're they're really kind of a, a sort of a, a grinder engine to get more games out there, which is a okay. good thing. But they some of these may be a little underdeveloped. Okay. Yeah. As as for um, Monster Dentist, I agree. I I don't know how much fun this would be. Like, yeah, the first couple rounds, I'm sure, are a lot. I'm sure it's a lot of fun. I also think this is probably be a good one at 3 a.m. and extra life when you're a little punch drunk or with adult beverages who are drunk the other way. I personally, I, I just wanted to bring this up because I think the mechanics neat. Like, like I love that mirror to look at a bottom of a deck thing. I just, I want to do, some, I'm not even a game designer. I have no <laughs> aspirations to be a game designer, but that makes me want to do something with that. Yeah. And I think, you know what? I think, Korea public, uh, board games might have a, a bunch of little nifty things like that hidden yeah. away in some what might otherwise be less than fantastic games. But that was Monster Dentist from Korea Board Games. All right, the other Korea Board Games game I want to showcase is the Showdown Tactics. So players have a set of Mahjong style tiles numbered one to nine, even numbers in one color and odd numbers in the other. Then there's this electronic thing you put between the two players that has a bunch of slots on it. And there's like a central slot on each side, one for each player. And then there's a bunch of places to put the other tiles as you play through. And what you do here is it randomly determines a winner, uh, a leader, and you're going to put one of your tiles face down on your side. And then your opponent's going to put one of their tiles face down on the other. And then what the machine does is figures out which is the higher number out of, out of nine, right? One to nine. And it's going to tell you who won. And then you're going to put them up on the top of this plastic thing. And it shows like an LED showing who won that round. And you're going to keep doing this until you played nine rounds or someone has gotten five wins because it's a best of best of five or best five out of nine. Now, there is one other twist to this. There's also the strategic rule, right, where a one beats a nine. So there's that to it. And what I liked about this is this is a game that wouldn't work without the technology. You couldn't play this, right? Because if you were just playing card face up, I could card count. Like I know what you have left. You played a four. I played a five. I beat you by one. I know you no longer have a four. Well, you're playing this. If I play a four and I win, I know you played a one, two, or three. But I don't know if you played a one or a two or a three. And that just leads to some interesting brain space to me. And what this really reminded me of is it's basically war, right? It's who played the higher card. But there was an 80s game that my dad had, and this is one of my favorite games going up, called Electronic General. And what it was, was basically, and I don't even know if there was a licensing issues here, but it was a knockoff of Stratego, where you have your numbered pieces on one side, and you had your general, and you had bombs and assassins, and you were playing this area control game. But what happened was when you attack someone else, it worked just like this showdown tactics. You put your piece on your side of the board and your opponent puts their piece on that side of the board and it plays this little music and then tells you who wins. So you had that whole fog of war. So it was Stratego with a fog of war, which I thought was fantastic. Like Stratego always has a fog of war, but when you attack someone, you, they have to reveal. So again, you never know, was the thing that beat you higher or was it a bomb or whatever? And that's what the showdown tactics reminded me of a lot. And so I think some of this for me is nostalgia that I really loved Electronic General and though this would be a simplified version. I think it's neat. The one thing I did ask that they could not answer is if you could turn off the battle music. Because I got to admit, even just watching them play three games in a row, I was a little tired of the fact you put your things up and you had to wait for a bit while play some funky music to tell you who won. Yeah, well, and again, that's that's sort of what I I kind of expect from this company. <laughs> again, a really interesting concept. It's a it's a it's an interesting gimmick, but have they really done the best things with it? Maybe, yeah. maybe not. I could see grabbing this as uh, as a, a Christmas gift for someone young, uh, you know, as a way yeah. to, to fun way to play war and, you know, think about stuff. So to be honest, you know what? I wish they'd just re-released Electron General. Like, make make this the battle system in something bigger. Well, there is a digital Stratego, so. Oh, maybe that is a version. I, I haven't kept up on that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but that was Showdown Tactics from Korea Board Games. All right. This is taking longer than I thought it was, so I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Next up, I have a game from Goliath. Um, this is called Rule the Realm, 
this is a a really unique looking game so it's a big plastic pegboard with all like pegs probably the wrong the pegs are poking up it's not something you peg things into and then you open up a map that's on a spiral and you put it over top and you get this like fantasy map and then players somehow use elastics to claim sections of the board and it's a it's an area majority thing now again there was no information about this other than that they really did not and this unfortunately goliath wasn't really interacting with the chat much so i couldn't really tell how to play but i love the idea of using elastics and different like the shapes you can make were really cool to play some kind of area control game it just looked really neat now what i did learn is i was like hey this is an onboard game geek and that is something they did reply to and they said oh when we first announced it was called kachuk so this is a localization by goliath of kachuk renamed to rule the realm probably because what's kachuk yeah it's interesting so kachuk is actually the russian version of the original game uh kachuk was actually released in english as elastium so i didn't even see that one. and goliath appears to be possibly new maps to go on okay. the board to change because the elastic so was definitely Kachuk, a book yeah elastium kachuk was more uh abstract um and from what i could see of the playing uh it was both area uh control so you were not only trying to take areas inside your elastics but also using elastics even just between two pegs to block someone else okay, from yeah, yeah. expanding that way and so there's some interesting gameplay i think the uses of elastics a lot makes that um gives you some interesting options yeah. to do that way but uh, i i checked out the reviews of kachuk on board uh -huh. game geek and initially it looked really good they've got us it's a seven five uh, which is a solid, solid review. Yeah. That's... And then I scrolled through them, and there are a lot of tens from before it was released. Oh. So I'm not really trusting the actual, and then reading through the people who took the time to review. Again, it's interesting. The uh, there, there are some interesting gameplay mechanics available through the use of the elastics, but one it's only really interesting and two elastics mm. dry out and yeah, you can buy oh, more, yeah. but you got to get ones that are the right size and you got to, yeah. so there's some, there's some pluses and minuses to it. It would probably be really nice to look at on a demo night and get mm. some interest. It's got some table presence. There's definitely that. Yeah. See the, the, the thing that scared me the most about this game, to be honest, is the fact that Goliath put it out. Now I'm not trying to be little Goliath, but they are not known for their heavy strategy games. This is the company that brings you the the, the toy based games, the toy horrific games, like Greedy Granny and and the Lost. Uh, sh there's one about a couch, and then the Shark Bite, where you're trying to pull things out of a shark's mouth before it closes. They actually publish a version of the 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 fishing game where the little fish pop up and their mouths open and close. It, it, it's just not a strategy game company, right? right? Though they do publish Rummy Cub, so I don't know. I. It, who knows? To they, be honest, they do have like, a lot of um, game show licenses uh, in in certain okay. countries. So the, uh, I know that, like the, in the UK, a lot of the game shows that are on BBC and, and ITV, they have licenses does. too. All right, but just in general, like you all know, I generally prefer heavier games. I'm not much of a party game fan, so I don't know. Just looking at this, it's just that idea of using elastics for area control. I hadn't even thought about the fact of drying out. I don't doubt the game's interesting enough for, to play for long enough for them to dry out, but it might be one of those you put it on yourself and then pull it out a couple years later and want to play and it doesn't work. I just, I, I like the idea of using elastics for some kind of area of control, zone control and blocking. That just sounds neat. Uh, this one, I, I, want, I'm, I need a review. I, I want to see someone else review this. I, I don't even know if it would fit us or not, so I'm, I'd be kind of scared to reach out myself, <laughs> but I'm sure other reviews will be coming out once this is actually published, this new version. I'm, I, I want to see if there's a real game here. And that was Rule the Realm from Goliath. All right, Pandasaurus Games showcased a lot of stuff. Uh, they're really excited about Dinosaur World, which is the follow-up to um, their original Jurassic Park game. Uh, but what I want to talk about is something totally different, which is a game called Brew. And I got to say, immediately, as a beer connoisseur, I was like, oh, a brewing game. That should be cool. And I looked it up, and I'm like, this has nothing to do with alcohol. 
And then here's all these like cute fantasy creatures, actually really cool looking fantasy creatures. Kind of reminds me of like wildlings. And there's like there's all this like trees around this cool looking fox thing. And um, what what is this? So it ends up this is a fantasy game where you play characters stuck in a fantasy world where the timeline's been messed up and all the seasons are happening at once. And where brew comes in is that you are brewing potions using the seasons and the four elements. So you might have to go get whatever a winter element, or a snow element and a fire element to combine them. Uh, this is a dice based worker placement game. Um, I, I don't know a lot about it. There wasn't a lot of information here, but it just looked, really cool the the artwork was fantastic i really like the look of this game uh dice based worker placement sounds good to me i have enjoyed a lot of dice based worker placements like alien frontiers and i'm going to draw a blank and tales uh euphoria build a better dystopia are some examples or the um the valeria dice game that i can't remember the name of we did a preview of i totally forget what that one's called but the, the newest valeria game when it comes out is a dice based worker placement so i i like that mechanic just look great yeah, no, absolutely. The dice look fantastic. Uh, but my concern is, and just, again, I, we haven't played the game yet. This is just from the images available from the company. Mm -hmm. It looks very busy. There are five different kinds of dice, eight different kinds of tokens, plus cards, plus boards. But now, with all that stuff, it all looks fantastic. Yeah. The art on this and the work on the dice and everything are really fantastic. Uh, but there's a lot of bits. <laughs> yeah, you know what though? That that kind of fits what I think back to Dinosaur Island. Like, remember when the first time I laid that out on the table? That's I was like, true. Oh, that's true. Yeah, Dinosaur Island is a hog, right? So that doesn't surprise me from Pandasaurus, nor does it scare me because Dinosaur Island is a surprisingly simple game once you start playing, but there, it requires a lot of stuff. So the Valeria game I was trying to think of is Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Thank you, Red Meeple Ryan, in the chat room. Yes, I should remember that. <laughs> That was actually a really good game. Check out my review on the blog. Preview on the blog. I but this game copy. was Brew from Pandasaurus. <laughs> I'm amused by our chat room. Our chat room thinks we're playing good cop, bad cop. No, it's totally <laughs> unintentional. Though it's probably better than our usual we agree on everything type Fair of enough. content we normally have. <laughs> yeah, let us know, actually. Uh, this is our first time really doing a show quite with this format, so... Most excited about stuff, does Sean Kerr, I, I guess, is the format. <laughs> uh, next up, I do have another Pandasaurus game. Uh, this is a game called The Loop, which immediately made me think Tales of the Loop and brand ambiguity, which drives me nuts. But this is The Loop, which has nothing to do with Tales from the Loop or The Loop in Tales from the Loop. This is a cooperative time travel based game, which could have happened because of The Loop but never mind. You are trying to stop a mad scientist from destroying the timeline. It's a cooperative game. Uh, one of the things about this is a very cool toy horrific piece that's this thing in the middle that looks like some sci-fi machine that's a dice tower, and you're going to drop the dice into it, and they're going to come out. But they're, the way it's designed is it only comes out onto three spots, like three spots. It's got this like hexagonal board. Well, it's not a hex because there's seven sides. So you have this seven-sided board. And well, when you drop the dice in, it only come out on possibly three of those. But you never know which of the three. And one of the actions you can do is turn this machine. And what these dice represent is what the villain's doing and then what part of the timeline they're, they're so, affecting. So just to be clear, they aren't actually dice. They're just little mini cubes. Oh, I thought they were dice. Okay. Nope, just see, cubes. that's that's what happens when all I see is a static image on a screen. All right, so cubes come out. And what whatever these cubes represent is is the bad guy doing something and where they're doing it. Now, on the player side, this is like that part, it's neat. The player side is a tableau building program movement game. You are building a time loop that you are going to repeat over and over. This is your time loop of actions and every time cycle, you're going to do the same action and you can run that loop any number of times. You can just keep running your loop over and over and over and possibly win the game with the perfectly designed loop, or you can break it and make a brand new time loop of actions that you can run over and over. That just sounded really neat. Like it reminds me a bit of mechs versus minions, which is a program movement game that is very different from robo rally in the fact that you program the slots and they stay there every round. So again, you're kind of making like a growing tableau, but this sounds like way more detailed. 
Whereas mechs versus minions is like you move, you shoot, or you turn. And when you move, you get to pick where. And when you turn, you get to pick your direction. This seems a little like these aren't move. It's it's not logo, right? You're not programming a miniature to move on the board. It's programming your actions. Now, I don't know exactly what these actions are. Again, preview at a Gen Con on a live stream. But just sounds cool. Uh, like I, By the end, I'm like, okay, the Dice Tower thing's neat. But I really love the idea of building a time and running an engine. Like, that's pure engine building. And you run your until it doesn't work anymore, and then you build a new engine. That sounds fascinating to me. No, absolutely. And I think, again, the art on this one is very distinctive and very interesting. Uh, what's really fun for me, I, me as, a, as a language geek, uh, Pandasaurus in the North American version has gone with the villain being named Dr. Faux, F-A-U-X, the French Faux, to play, as a playoff of Faux. Uh, yeah. In the original version, the doctor, it's actually Dr. Fou, which is a mm. play off of the French F-O-U for crazy. So they're, they're, they're playing with their puns. Uh, I, I do have to say, though, in some regions of the U.S., Dr. Faux, F-A-U-X, will never be pronounced that way. Nope, that's uh, <laughs> totally true. Though I do appreciate that they moved away from the calling the doctor crazy. That's not really the best term to use nowadays, and most of us have learned that by now. Yeah. So I am glad that they did switch it. And that was The Loop from Pandasaurus Games. All right, we're at the end. Last one. Last one for the night from the Gen Con Spring Showcase. And this was Monstrosity. Now, I don't think this is a new game. I have no idea. This was literally the last event of the show before the wrap-up where they got six popular streamers together to play this game together. Now, the, to be honest, until seeing the game played, I didn't care about this game. Like, I knew it existed. I knew it was yet another draw thing. I didn't know if it was draw a bit, pass it on, someone else was drawing it. I knew it was monster-based. I, I have telestrations. I love telestrations. I, I don't need it. And, and, and if I want something a little heavier, I have... Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's got a dragon on it. Pictionary is not the word. Begins pick domino. Pick, it begins pick. All right, if I remember it, it's a Vlada Shavadol drawing game. Uh, if I can remember the name of that, I'll bring it in. But anyway, I, I'm happy with the drawing games I own. Um, I am curious about that tattoo one. That looked kind of cool as something a little different because it kind of adds in the butt weight. There's more description thing and pitch to it. So I had no clue what this is. But then I watched this. Pictomania. Thank you, Ryan. My brain's just today. So I saw this live stream and I was like, oh, wow, that looked like fun. Like that, I, I could see having fun with my gaming group playing this game. So the way this game works is uh, the, like the clue giver, right? Just like all these games, there's always someone who gives the clue and everyone else is trying to guess, right? So what they do is they draw a card and it's got this picture of a monster on it. And then they have a very short amount of time, like 20 seconds, if I remember correctly, to describe what they see. And everyone else just sits and listens attentively and they try to catch in all the details. Then you start the official round, which is the drawing and question phase. And the players are trying to draw the monster that was just described. But while drawing, they can now ask questions. So it can be like, oh, wait, you said the monster had a human face in the eye, like a whole human face with eyes on the eyes? Okay. And, well, also have like a mouth and nose? Yeah, it has a mouth and nose. And then you hear the other people talking like, oh, I didn't draw mine with a no, You didn't say it had a nose. You have this thing. Now there's a timer. I don't know how long the timer was, to be honest. It, it ran out at some point. Actually, I remember watching the stream. It was hilarious because we're like, wait, how much time's left on the timer? Like one second. Like, no, oh, that didn't give us enough time to fix. Because it, it, it was at the very end. It ends up the monster wasn't facing forward, but was walking sideways. So absolutely. Well, actually, it ended up one person did draw it sideways. But most people were drawing this face on a monster. So then once you're done, the players all hold up their monster and here's where every drawing party game falls apart there's some weird system for scoring where the person picks their favorite i always hate those rules like personally i think it should be objective it should be like which one looks the closest to this and maybe everyone votes but no it was just like which one does the person who is describing the monster like the most whatever i haven't read the rules maybe that's maybe that's just how they played it i just gotta say this looked like way more fun than i would have thought like i, I want to play this I, I want this at our next extra life event like it, it'd be a very different vibe than telestrations but still i think a ton of fun now my worry though 
is I, I don't know how many cards there are. Like, I have a feeling you'd eventually learn all the monsters. And kind of like once you use one monster with one group, it's kind of used up as far as I could see. Like, I, I don't see how it wouldn't, right? Like, I'd be sitting there, like, after playing our 50th game of Monstrosity going, yeah, I remember the monster with a face for an eye, draw that one, right? Like, I, I don't know. Uh, so uh, it is newish. It's 2020. I don't know the exact uh, okay. when in 2020 it came out. Um, <laughs> Eric Lang says, imagine if Telestrations featured your most hilariously horrifying Freudian nightmares. Yeah. Um, so I, and now to address your, your concern about cards, they've already put out an expansion. All right. Cute creatures. So they are looking to support it. And it's 40 cards Ooh, uh, extra slow. on the, on the expansion. So okay. I don't know. I actually don't know how many there are in the box. I can't find that number. But for ten bucks, you get forty more monsters, okay. which isn't too bad. Uh, and it yeah, also I don't know the price point. I'm, I'm assuming this board. is assuming this is a very low player or uh, cost game. At twenty five bucks US. Okay. So so now when these people played, they didn't have player boards. But they were playing over Zoom. So right. that is something else. Here's a huge bonus for this game. There's a game you can play over Zoom. Absolutely. Which, like, like, and they were drawing. Like, one person had literal lined paper. Someone else had an art pad. Someone else just had a giant whiteboard they were drawing on. I draw. I screen. don't know if the game <laughs> comes with. It does. Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. It comes with. There's, so there's that a, justifies there's the There's a prize. big score. There's a big scoring chart that you can like keep score on for everybody. Sort of like a like a movie movie board sort of thing. Okay. Everyone has write on wipe off uh, pages. All right. So that, that so, yeah. more justifies the price. I'm thinking it was that price for just a deck of cards. And no, like, no. Mm. no, no, this is a box. This yeah. Is a, so this was, this box. was just because they were playing it over zoom. Yeah. Uh, I want to so, play this over zoom. Like, like <laughs> the only problem is almost everyone needs a copy or I guess I could like close my eye and hold it up and tell everyone to close their eyes until, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, it, you know what? It's, it's a fun party game, but their demo images look better than anything I've ever drawn in my oh, yeah, life. Of course. I, I, th that's all that always bothers. Like, why not show some real art that people actually draw <laughs> in the game with like, you know, stick figures that don't even look like stick figures. Yeah. I don't <laughs> but, know. I, I, I can't help you with that one, yeah. but that you know was, what? Pictomania. Pictomania is it's a mass market game. Like shows this dad drawing like a lasso and it's like a loop with a line. So it's out there, but I guess yeah. all the hobby gamers are like, actual artists <laughs> well that was mondrosity and it's available from either bread and circuses or deep water games depending on what region you're in now that's our coverage for the gen con spring showcase we're gonna head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has questions let's take a look at letter jam a cooperative word-based party game before we do i want to thank cge for providing us with a review copy of this game yeah, thanks, Chuck Games. Uh, Letter Jam was designed by Andra Scoopy and published by Chuck Games Editions in 2019. Uh, this party game plays from two to six players, with each game taking, uh, this is rough, um, a half an hour to an hour, depending on how much deliberation time the players use, uh, trying to come up with clues or trying to figure out the clues they have and possibly getting confused and having to look back at previous rounds. This, this one's rough to fit in a distinct time box. Now, this is a cooperative word game where players are trying to figure out the letters they have in front of them while providing single word clues to the other players that will help them guess the letters they have in front of themselves. Now, after multiple rounds of clue giving, if all the players not only figure out what letters they have in front of them, but are able to spell a word with that, then the entire group wins. Now, if players run out of clues before everyone's able to do this, the group as a whole loses. One thing that really impressed both of us with this game is the component quality, mm -hmm. which you can see for yourself in our Letter Jam unboxing video on YouTube. I was impressed by every aspect of everything that came in this box. Uh, the quality of the letter cards that have some of that UV coating to make the letters, excuse me, the quality of the letter cards that have that UV coating that make the letters stick out, the, the clarity of the rule book, um, even the fact the game came with a full set of pencils for each player and a sharpener for them. So you could literally play it with out of the, bo out of the box without needing anything from outside the box. Though by far the most impressive thing in this game are these poker chip like counters like I'm, I'm talking like real weighted poker chips and all they're used for is to identify letters from one to eight like that's it 
that these are like the ones that came in the original printing of Splendor, if you were lucky enough to get that, or if you paid for the upgrade that came out later. Like, I don't get it in a way. Like, the production quality here is way above what you'd expect from, like, a card-based party game. Yeah. So what are we doing with these great components? All right. So Letter Jam is quite a bit more involved than most, if not all, other party games. Um, it has pretty unique gameplay elements that I got to admit aren't that easy to explain without just reading you the 16-page or whatever rule book. But I'm going to try my best to summarize this here. So a game of Letter Jam starts with each player taking part of the deck of letters and picking five that form a word. They Once they got their five, they shuffle them and pass those letters to the player on their left. Now that player can't look at these, right? They just put them down face front and face down in front of them, not knowing any of them. Then they take the first one and without looking at it, flip it up and put it in a plastic stand so that everyone else can see it, but they can't. So each player has a set of five cards chosen by someone else that they mm -hmm. can't look at and can only show anyone else one at a time. That's correct. Now, if you're playing with less than six players, you are also going to set up a number of what they call non-player stands. This is so that the total count of players, virtual and real, in the game is always six. Now, each of these non-player area gets a small stack of cards that's based on the number of players, and you're going to flip up the first one face up into a stand and play so everyone can see it. Uh, you're also going to place a green chit, little green token with it, which I'll get to in a minute what those are for. Now, in the end, when you're set up and ready to play, everyone should have a hidden card in front of them and see five other cards. No matter how many players you're playing with, whether it's two players or you're playing six, you always have one in front of you you can't see and five others you can. Now, there is one wild card in the game that's placed face up in the center of the table, and then the rest of the letter cards are made into a deck in the center of the table as well. And then you put out this flower card that you put these tokens on red and green tokens now the size of the flower and how many tokens based on the number of players each player is going to take a worksheet they then fold it in half so that when you stand it up on the table the other players can't see what you're doing with it now this worksheet kind of gives you a place to mark down notes and write down the clues you're going to get during the round and also importantly has a list of what letters are in the deck because what they've done in the design of this game, which I think is brilliant, is they didn't include the less often used letters. So there's no J, Q, or Z. I don't remember the exact full list. But you won't find those in the deck at all. And if during the game you want to use a word that has those letters, well, that's what that wild card's for. So it's J, Q, V, X, and Z, which are unavailable. Yeah. And now, this is an important aspect to remember at first, but also easy to forget about mm -hmm. later in the game as you're struggling to think up words or or what your letters might be and what words might have been combined it's really easy to accidentally think about a j in your word and i speak from experience <laughs> <laughs> so now everyone's set up right everyone can see five letters they got a hidden one in front of them the decks are out the wild cards out so now what you're going to do is you're going to deliberate everyone's going to sit here and talk and decide who's going to give the first clue now, this clue is going to be a word that can be spelled with all the letters you can see. Now, there are a bunch of communication rules that come into play here that really restrict what you're allowed to talk about. You can state how long the word you've chosen is. You can be like, I have a clue for a six-letter word. And then Sean might be like, well, I have a clue for three-letter words. Then he can say how many players will help, but not which one. So if we're playing in a three-player game, I can say I got a six-letter word that helps both of you. Or I could say I have a six-letter word that helps one of you, but I can't say, well, it'll help D or it'll help Sean. I have to just keep it vague. You can then say, I'm also going to use so many non-player stands. So in a three-player game, there's three non-player stands. I would be like, well, I'm going to help out one of you, but I'm going to use all the non-player stands. And then whether or not you're using the wild card. Yeah, I have a six-letter word. It's going to help one of you out. It's going to use three wild card, three non-players, but I had to use the wild card. Now, you're also not allowed to give any ind indication of how good your clue is. So you can't say like, well, I've got an obscure one that's this, because that actually gives players a bit of information. Or I've got a popular three-letter word. You can't do that. All you can give is letters, who it can help, sorry, not who, how many people it can help, and how many letter stands, and the wild card, yes or no. And this is more of a struggle than something simple like just no table talk yeah. at all. Since you are allowed to talk, but with these strict rules that become difficult to stay true to yeah. specifically 
when you're trying to figure out whose clue to choose, how do you know which is who, whose clue you want to choose with this limited information? It's so easy to just suggest that yours is better by some reason, and that's yeah. not allowed. Yeah, I'll admit we were bad for, oh, I got a good one. That was just so easy to say. Yeah. Or I really can't come up with that. You're really not supposed to do that. And there's a good reason for this. Like, it, it really does improve the game by not cheating. And now, while coming up with a word, what I think is really important is it can be any length. You could come up, I guess you could do a one-letter word, um, which would mean it's only a couple possible letters. But it is a couple possible letters. But you can use a two-letter word. Or you can also use like you only see five letters right and the wild card but you can use each letter more than once so you could come up with a seven eight i don't know 11 letter word if you can do it but interestingly too it's also possible for multiple players or the non-player stands when i say players i mean either person or stands here to have the same letter and then the clue giver has got to decide does he just tag the one person like if two people have a t does he and he needs two t's does he put a chip on both tees or does he put two chips on the one tee right now you just deliberate as a group going all right i got a five word clue, i got a three i got a two word clue like you know what sean let's go with your five clue because you know deanna really needs some help and you're you i think you're help you said you're helping both of us so i know she's gonna need help so then the player is going to give their clue and the way they do this is not by talking you don't say your word because well that would give away the letter in front of everyone you then use those poker chips that we talked about earlier that are numbered one through eight, and you're going to put them out going the first letter in the word is this, and you put your token in front of the stand with that letter. And the second word letter is this, the fourth, third letter, and so on. You put all these chips out. Now, note you can also use the wild card. So you just put a chip on the wild card, but it can be one letter only. So you can't like put two chips on the wild card, meaning two different letters. You could put two chips on the wild card if you needed two J's, for example, because everyone knows there's no J card, or at least hopefully they've remembered. <laughs> now, the other thing too is you can go bigger than eight and the game just suggests do whatever to remember what's higher than eight which is fine and while you're doing this the players who have clue tokens on their letter who are involved right the, the their letter in front of them is in the word are going to start noting this down on the worksheet where it's got a spot to write the first letter second letter third letter, fourth letter fifth letter and you're going to put like star for the wild card and you're going to put like question mark for you because you don't know what your letter is then you're going to have this, this deduction period where you're going to look and try to figure out what your letter is. Now, they don't say it. They don't go, oh, my letter's an R. No, they just decide. And if they're certain they have a letter, they know it's an R, they're going to take their card and put it face down and say, I know what this is. And then they're going to take their next card and put it face up. Yeah, no, and it's the, the problems that emerge are real. Uh, for instance, two players turning up a T at the same time is really hard to deal with unless you yeah. just give up on trying to give one of those players a clue until the other one changes theirs. Uh, especially something like a double T is mm -hmm. really difficult to try and give someone the idea that, yeah, you're, you've given two different letters, but it's the same letter. It's it's yeah. it's mind bending. <laughs> Double vow vowels too. I also found very hard to do with. Now, every time you do give a clue, you have to take a token from the flower on the table. When you give out your first clue, you have to take a red token. Um, the green tokens can't be taken until all the red ones are gone, and red tokens have to be evenly distributed among the players. So what this does is all it does is make sure that the same person doesn't give out clue the clues every time. So it's a way to make sure that everyone's involved and everyone gets to play. Uh, though you'd have to anyway, because if someone never gives out a clue, they're, well, I guess, no, you wouldn't ever have to give out a clue to guess your word. So it is a way to, to force every player to give out, depending on the number of players, at least one or two clues. I, I think it's cool. Now, at any point, you use up the last token. At this point, you're into the green ones. You lose the game as a group. You just, you, you ran out of clues. You ran out of the time. Yeah, so the flower token thing is weird. Um, honestly, I don't really get it. It works, but yeah. it's just unnecessary. It was something you could just ignore. I mean, if if the manual just said put X green tokens and Y red tokens out, 
and take them out this way, it would be way fine, simpler, and you wouldn't have to have this extra component of these cards with yeah. silly graphics on them. And they're, not, they're, they're fine graphics. There's nothing ugly about them. They're just unnecessary. Yeah, well, no, this game has, like, four artist credits on it. So, like, maybe that flower is drawn by a famous Czech artist or something. I don't know. I, I don't know why it's a flower. It's a flower. Reds the petals, greens the, the leaves and the stems. Whatever. So once your round's done, right, everyone's either went, yeah, I know what my letter is, or they left it face up going, eh, sorry, I'm still not sure. Uh, you got to do some cleanup. So someone's going to pick up all the clue tokens. And importantly, all the non-player cards that were used are discarded and replaced by new cards from that non-player deck. And if you deplete a non-player deck, you get that green token. Remember earlier I said you put a green token with every stack? Well, you gain that, which gives your group as a whole more clues by the end of the game. Um, and then if you have depleted a deck, you're then going to draw cards from the main deck for that non-player character for each round. You don't get any bonus for getting rid of them. Though. Now, if at any point a player has guessed all their letters, they start each round by drawing a random card that they don't get to see, and they just place it face up in a stand. Now, during the round, the player, if the player is involved and they get to guess what the letter is and they get it right, this time they do say it out loud. They're going to say it and look. They get to place it face up in the center of the table next to the wild card. Now, going forward for the rest of the game, everyone else could use, well, and them can use that letter as part of their clue. But if it is used, you do have to discard it at the end of the round it's used. Yeah, I, I'm not, I feel like that's almost a punishment for finishing mm -hmm. early. Uh, again, I haven't played this as, as many times as you have, but I, I feel like I'd be tempted to not reveal that I knew my last clue too early uh, if others were struggling simply because it would just be adding more randomness in there, whereas they'd have a, a fixed clue they could work off of uh, otherwise. So I don't know. It, it's meant to be a reward. Like as by design, according to the rule book, it's supposed to be a reward, not a punishment. And by guessing bonus letters, you have more letters out on the table to choose from when making clues, which should give you more options and make the game easier going forward. And then there's the weird thing that we're going to get to later with the scoring, which I'm not even going to explain in detail later, but there is a scoring system and you can use these bonus letters at the end of the game to make longer words. And I honestly think that's the only way to get to the higher scoring tiers mm. is to use bonus letters. So there is that aspect. So even if it does kind of muddy it up during the middle of the game, maybe you just ignore them until the last round and then try to make the biggest words you can. Right. Now letter jam continues until either you run out of clue tokens and you lose or all the players have guessed all their five letters in front of them. Now, again, guessed is on their, their sheet, right? Not You haven't said it out loud. If everyone's guessed, they're now going to use the worksheet to take those five letters and form a word. And then you're going to rearrange the cards in front of you to be that word. And then you get the big dramatic moment with the, the drum roll and you reveal one by one your cards and see if you formed a word. And if everyone has formed a valid five-letter word in front of them, they all win. Now, I did mention a scoring system. There is one included. Uh, we didn't pay much attention to this. Um, using this, you can make larger than five-letter words uh, at the end. You can even use the wild card to make a six-letter word, and they're worth one extra point. And then, like, your base word score is, like, five times the length of the word you spelled, so it's going to be, whatever, 25 points by default, or it's three times for 15 points. I, I honestly don't remember, because to me, the fun of the game was playing it. I didn't really care what our score was at the end. But there are rules for it. Uh, there is scoring. I guess you can post online how good your group did and compare it to other groups. I don't know. It's a co-op game. Why do you give me a score? I don't quite get it. But hey, some people like to rank themselves. You can do that. Now, this is the rules that I just covered is for the, the, the normal difficulty. Uh, there are rules to make things easier. Like you can play with less than five cards going down to as low as three or more than five going as high as seven. And what they strongly recommend is if you want to play this game with kids, you give the kids less letters than the parents, so they have less to guess. So I thought that was a, a, a cool way to balance the game. Same with, like, the first time you play. I would recommend the play maybe only doing four letters, just because uh, five takes a while. Like, uh, as I said, the, the game length, at least with us, we, we spend a lot of time deliberating. Yep. The scoring was interesting. <laughs> uh, note that you aren't required to guess the word that was given to you way back yep. at the start. And it is quite possible that if they didn't make notes, the person who gave you that word has no idea at this point what word they gave you. Yep. You just have to get a word. 
Yes. I got a, I got points because I managed to accidentally put together a five letter French word out mm -hmm. of my I had no idea what letters I have, but when I flipped it over, it was a five letter French word correctly spelled. Yes. I think it was two of yours. You didn't know what two of yours were. You yeah. were wrong on two of them, yeah. but it worked out. And honestly, the way the game scores, they call it more or less winning. And but they call it that when you get a proper word. Sean more or less won, as, as <laughs> according to the rules of the game. Whereas myself, I had a letter I didn't know what it was, so I used the wild card to make sure I spelled the word. Right. And it ended up I guessed it right, but just in case I, I was covered. I don't know. It, it, the, again, it's a co-op game. Like you win yep. or lose. Yep. I, I don't quite get the bearing rights, but I, I'm sure some people appreciate it. If it didn't have scoring, there'd be people screaming that where's the scoring system? Yep. So like most party games, toss it out. It's a, it's what is it all about the fun, the points don't matter, whatever that the who's yep. lined it anyways quote is. All right, we're going to jump in the time machine. We're going to go back to 2019. I remember hearing a ton of hype when this game first released. Like quite a few of the podcasters and and shows I watched were smitten with this game. And personally, eh, I, I as many of you know, I'm not a big party game fan. Like, yeah, yeah, there's a few I enjoy. Like I, I did Concept and I have Medium being one of the more recent ones. And I love, but wait, there's more. But like a... And uh, I don't know. And plus word games. I am not a big word <laughs> game fan. I, I I play against certain people who are really good at word games. And it's just not fun to watch their scores rank up where I spell nothing. Or playing uh, Scrabble versus my dad who has memorized all the two letter words <laughs> that are somehow legal in this game. Whatever. Due to all that, I, I admit, I didn't give it a shot. Like I, whatever, letter jam, people seem to be enjoying it. Now I was talking to Czech Games Edition about potentially re reviewing one of their other games, which sadly they did not let me check out, but they did offer to send me Letter Jam and Trap Words. And I figured, eh, you know what? People have given this a lot of buzz. I'll check it out. And I got to say, I'm glad I did. Um, as the other reviewers before me have said, this is a really solid cooperative party game experience. There are a number of things that I think make this game stand out from other party games and also from other word games, which is what made me enjoy it. Now, first off, as already mentioned a couple times, is that component quality. Like, this is a card-driven party game that could have just been a deck of letters and standees in a box and, and a set of rules, and that's it. And then I don't know what you use to number them, right? It could have been cardboard chits. Um, it could have just been a pad of worksheets. Like, it, it didn't need all this. Instead, you've got these super high-quality cards that are, I admit, are an odd size, so sleeping them may not be the easiest thing to do, but they're really solid and they made. So they got a UV coating on them. You've got stands that don't damage the cards in any way. Like, they're well-designed, so the cards easily slip in and out, but don't slip out when you don't want them to. There's cardboard, like, like instead of cardboard counters, you've got these poker chips. Like these are some of the best chips I have felt in a board game. Like they have significant weight. I I just really impressed by this. It's a party game. What's all this nice stuff? Honestly, the poker chips are both welcome and bizarre. There is no reason whatsoever for such a fantastic quality component in this game. Yet there it is. Yeah, I don't know. Now the next thing that sticks out to me is just the brilliance of the gameplay here. Like, this game reminds me the most of Hanabi. Uh, this is a another game where you're holding a hand of cards and you can't see your own hand. Everyone else can. So it's got that aspect. And Hanabi does it well. And Letter Jam just does a fantastic job of players having information that only the other players can see, right? Like, you don't know the letters in front of you, but everyone else does. And it just does that so well. Now, in Letter Jam, it's only one card. So, which I'm glad because I can't see trying to manage all five of your letters at once. And like, if they were all face up, no, thank you. I, I think this is perfect. Like that just trying to figure out one letter at a time is, is great for this game. They, they, they didn't over Hanabi it, right? They didn't just go, here's your hand, hold up your hand at cards. And they, yep. they managed to simplify it in ways that made it manageable. Yeah, now, as someone who plays Hanabi all the time on Board Game Arena, I agree. It's a really fun aspect, though it is worth mentioning that depending on your player count and the physical size of your table, you might mm. need to think a little bit about the layout and setup to ensure that people aren't able to accidentally cheat. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, especially, that glasses reflect. 
Yeah. And this is the sort of thing that's always a problem with hidden information games like this. Uh, pretty much the only one that doesn't is the card on a headband because it's actually essentially behind mm. your, vi- your 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 uh, your view. So I guess it's it's not as bad with this unless your glasses are really reflective because it would have to be reflecting the other player's stuff, right. not what's in front of you. So it's uh, to me that's mitigated quite a bit by this. Now, my favorite part, though, of Letter Jam is all about that whole clue system. Um, The way you give clues, the restrictions of what you can and cannot talk about. And I love that the best clue is often is not the biggest word, right? This is not a game about knowing eight word letter long words and seven letter long words. Like a good clue leaves the guessing player with absolutely no doubt whatsoever what letter they have in front of them when this system does reward players with a big vocabulary, it doesn't have to be big meaty words. Just lots of little words is good. Just uh, like having a big vocabulary is good, but not having to have no obscure words and two letter words, like in other word games. Yeah. Now, in addition to this, the rules for what words you can and cannot use are the loosest I have ever seen in a word game. And I love this. They, the, the words are basically anything your group thinks is a word is a word. This can be a proper name. It can be an abbreviation. It can be the name of your favorite anime character. The words don't even have to be in English or whatever your native language is. Like the last time we played, Sean noted he made a valid French word with his letters, and that worked. Yeah, I think this game would rock as a digital implementation especially since you don't have to worry about the setup or potentially revealing information that Mm -hmm. way uh the only question is how do you deal with words because if you implement some sort of dictionary you lose a little bit of the flexibility Mm -hmm. of the game being able to do whatever as long as everyone thinks it's a word the only thing i can see is you would need need to have voice chat like i would not want to have the clue conversation in a text chat I actually, I, I was thinking uh, even simpler. So it would be, uh, you know, I I know, you know, how many letters is your word? Five. How many people does it help? Two. Oh, okay. Right. Re- re- keep it. Yeah, that would definitely text. remove the. Yeah, yeah, it helps two of you. You know exactly. That, that, so that so you, you make it all help. on the digital interface, yeah. and you know if people want to chat about what happened last night on voice, great. But the True. game itself is just the information you're allowed to to use. So all I would do there is I wouldn't add in any dictionary. I would just let it say, like, when it ends, is this a valid word? Yes, no. Yeah. And let the group do it. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, you that sounds even, great. You even have the, the, the group vote. <laughs> you <know>. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? We might have to Google it. I wonder if anyone has put out a digital version of Letter Jam yet. Could be. We have to take a look for that. So Letter Jam, one of the things that may not be evident from this, but I, I don't know, I think it is, it sounds complex enough, is this is a lot thinkier than other party games. Like, I kind of hate the term a gamer's game, but you know what? That's kind of what you have here, right? Because it takes a good amount of thought to come up with good clues, especially a clue that's going to help more than one player and make it so it's completely unambiguous to both players. And then you also want to use up those non-player letters. So if you can come up with a clue that helps the entire table and uses up all the non-player letters, that is a great clue. That's the one we're probably going to go with. And then there's even some interesting long-term strategy that I didn't actually see until about our third play, where you know you can't give a player the right answer this round, but you know if you give another clue, you can probably narrow it down. Like I know I can get it so Sean knows this is one of two. Now all I have to do is give him another clue to make sure he knows which of those two it is and i think that's really cool and then along with the deduction with this is the deduction aspect right the the trying to figure out what your personal letters are and like this goes above just using the current clue like yes the current clue might give you in your first letter that's all you you have but then you're going to look at past clues as well as knowing the certain letters on the cards aren't on the cards which hopefully you remember and then the fact that you know and this is what, what really dawned on us in that third gameplay was, wait a minute, my five letters have to be able to spell a word. And I'm trying to figure out what my last letter is, and I have no clue, but it's definitely not this because that with those letters doesn't spell a word. And like, that's all meta, right? Like, that's not part of the clues that were given by the other players. It's like a, this really interesting way you have to think about words and letters. 
Yeah. A, a couple drinks in, and I think this game would be far beyond my reach. It's not a late night while you're tired game, really. No, like, like <laughs> I, actually, to be honest, I'm, I, I'm almost wondering if we should stop calling it a party game. Like, it doesn't have that. Ha, ha. Well, it does, actually. No, yeah. we laughed. We yeah, had no, the fun we did. Of, but especially just, at the end, going back, thinking. what was your third clue? Yeah, like, yeah. that was definitely. You, you have to be clear thinking. Yes. Uh, and also, I would recommend that uh, anyone who's playing, if you are playing the game, write down, even if you're giving the yes. clue, write that down too. Putting yeah. all the information on your sheet helps everyone figure things out later that you don't necessarily know you're going to need to want to do, but you yeah. will. So no, at the end down. you're gonna you're gonna there's gonna be someone you're like what the heck was your third clue because yep. I had um, oh, I was trying to remember one I had I remember I remember it was Cupid was what you had decided the yeah. word was and I can't w- remember what I put Fitbit. it was Fit, it was fit, it was Fitbit no that was, was the one I gave oh, you was, was Fitbit did, yeah. I gave Sean Fitbit to finally figure out that he had guessed something wrong in his first letter but he'd never figured out what the first letter was right yeah that was the last time we played all right finally. Uh, one other thing that impressed me about Letter Jam, we're, we're just like, we're, we're gushing here. Um, I was surprised how well this works with two. Like, like most party games don't work with two at all. This one worked rather well. Now, I'll admit, it feels very different with two players, especially because like, it's always you're giving a clue to the other player. There's none of that guesswork. And it felt more thick, like more like coming up with clues was a little harder, but it worked. Um and it's that fact that doesn't matter how many physical players you have, you always have six letters up. You always have five you can see and one you can't. And so it didn't matter. Now, I will admit, I did prefer the game with more, but I like having the option for Deanna and I to break this out for a couple's night. Yeah, I, I do think, unlike many party games, this one would be hard to play with teams, though. Yeah, uh, many, many party games do easily adapt to you know one player becoming a team. But mm-hmm. uh, but this one not so much. Maybe for giving out clues, but the deduction part would be you, yeah. well, you can't table talk, right? Like you couldn't talk to your partner because it would give stuff away. Yeah. All right. Overall, uh, as you can tell, I was impressed. Uh, the Letter Jam from Check Games Edition. This is an extremely solid, impressive, cooperative, word-based party game. Features excellent components and surprisingly deep and engaging gameplay. I greatly enjoy the fact that this game rewards players for choosing clever clues over the biggest, longest, most complex word possible that uses the weirdest letters. I love that. This is a very neat and surprisingly thinky group puzzle that is a ton of fun to play, whether you more or less win or more or less lose. Yep. When you have time, be sure to check out our, uh, I completely agree. (laughs) <laughs> Sean's jumping ahead. We're all good. Uh, if you're a fan of word games, like just pick this up. Like it is a, a, a no brainer to me. Like you need to pick up Letter Jam. Like this is a different twist on letter games. Now I will admit this is a bit on the complicated side. This may scare away non gamers, but I do think it would be a great game to play with fans of different games like Scrabble or Boggle, the lighter mass market ones. So I would recommend an experienced hobby gamer be the one to teach and introduce the game so they can kind of get the concepts out there. Because this is going to scare someone. If someone someone who's used to Boggle grabs the rule book for this, they're going to be like, whoa, what is this, right? So the other thing I would say is if you're looking for a heavier than usual party game, they feel like, oh, party games are too flippant. I want something with a bit of meat. I think this is going to be a good choice. I also think this is going to be a good choice for players who like word games but hate losing to players with better vocabularies who have memorized official word lists and have played thousands of rounds of Boggle and Strag. Uh, This is my, why I like this game. That's why I think you'll enjoy this because it's not about figuring out those big words that use Q's and Z's or those special little words that that only work in this game. Now, if you hate word games of all forms and shapes, you can probably pass on this, but I honestly would suggest trying a demo at some point. Because this might win you over because it's that different from other word games. Yeah. When you have time, also be sure to check out our written review of Letter Jam over at tabletopbellhop.com. Today we're going to be taking a look at the cooperative game, The Crew, Quest for Planet Nine. Before we do get started, we want to send a big shout out and a thank you to local Windsor gamer, Kevin, who was awesome enough to gift us with a copy of this game. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Kevin. So the crew, Quest for Planet Nyam, was designed by Thomas Singh and features rather evocative artwork from Marco Armbruster. Bruster. Here in North America, it was published by Cosmos in 2019. This is a cooperative trick-taking card game for two to five players, where each round of the game takes anywhere from five minutes to half an hour, depending on the scenario you're playing and how quickly you win or fail. I will say most rounds do tend to fall on the shorter side of this scale. Now, the crew has won a number of awards and accolades um, and even more nominations. This includes the Spellenprix Best Advanced Game, the Guildbricken Best Adult Game, the Dutcher Spiel Priest Best Family Slash Adult Game, the Meeple's Choice Award, the Golden Geek Best Cooperative Game, and most prestigiously, most well-known, the 2020 Kenner Spiel de Jar, the biggest award in board gaming. Now, there are a number of components that come with this card game beside cards, and for a good look at those, you should check out our The Crew unboxing video over on YouTube. So, in addition to a main deck of cards, which is split over four suits with cards numbered one to nine, and four rocket cards numbered one to four, you also get this smaller deck of hobbit-sized cards that match the original deck, excluding the rockets. There's a number of tokens, including pass tokens, communication tokens, a commander sandy, and a distress signal token. Overall, the component quality is excellent, uh, especially for the cards themselves, which have a very playing card like feel and texture to them and they feature some great panoramic artwork where if you put the number one to nine you get this really cool space picture and some really easy to distinguish symbology which will help anyone with color blindness issues so what are we doing with these cards and tokens how do you play the crew all right so for being what's really an abstract strategy game the crew features a significant amount of background and story so in this game, you are playing a, a, a crew, a set of astronauts about to leave Earth on a quest to find Planet Nine, which I'm assuming is Pluto. Isn't that the ninth planet? Or maybe they're trying to find something else, but whatever. Now you're going to do this by playing through 50 unique scenarios in turn, starting from number one, going up to number 50, each of which progresses the story and increases the difficulty and complexity of the game. Now the scenarios start off as training missions, uh, while well, you're still supposedly on the ground and are very simple and do a great job of teaching you how to play the crew. So to be fair, there is no real need to know anything about the story or background. Having played it on Board Game Arena, I'm actually unaware of the, the story portion and I still love the game. Fair enough. Now to start a game with the crew, you're going to pick one of the missions to play. Now, I admit, like I just said, you're usually going to start at one and go up to 50, but honestly, the game can be played by randomly picking one, playing your favorite you played before or whatever. Now, each of these missions is going to set a goal for the game, which always involves some type of rule for who you want at the table to take specific tricks. Now, usually, this involves one or more players having to take a trick featuring a specific numbered card in a specific suit, like Sean must take the three in yellow. Sometimes more than one player needs to take a specific trick. And then other times they'll need to get these in a specific order. Now there are also missions where specific players take a set number of tricks or they have to take a trick including a one or it's uh, whatever. It, there, there's tons of comments, 50 of these, right? The game is really all about the right player winning the right trick at the right time. Right. And you're picking in order the tasks that you're going to do each mission. So yeah. if there are six tasks that need to be done, you pick one and then you go around the table when everyone's oh. picking, but you, you do get a choice. Yes. Now these tasks are determined by the, the smaller Hobbit cards I mentioned. You're going to shuffle that. You're going to flip it up and then you're going to look at the mission to see what you do with it. So you got a deck of missions that are going to come up. Now there's 36 cards in the smaller deck. What's missing are the rocket cards, which I'll explain why those matter in a bit. Uh, so mission one, it's one player has to take one trick with, a, with a task card, really simple. Well, there's 36 different versions of that mission, right? Cause there's 36 different cards. You might be going for the one yellow or the four blue or the seven green. When you get to mission two, you're now trying to get two cards. Now you're up to 1260 possible combinations of, and, and both those numbers don't account for the fact 
the who the captain is each round changes and who will want the cards like yes the fact i want it one round maybe next time sean's the one that's gonna one that wants the trade like there is a huge amount of replayability in just a single mission in this game yeah, and then are you adding the what hands you get, what cards you get dealt into your hand, yes. which yet again adds to the, uh, the the changes and the difference in the in the, the possibilities. Yeah. So it it really gets kind of crazy the number of potential uh, re- uh, replays. Like I would honestly say infinitely replayable. Like until you're sick of the game, <laughs> you're 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 probably never going to play the same game twice with all of the variables in play, even just on that first mission. Just with the number of variables. Now, with these Hobbit-sized task cards, there are a bunch of tokens. And these are to indicate things like, oh, this card has to be taken first, this one has to be taken second, or this card must be taken before this other card, or a bunch of the other things as indicated by the missions. So what you're going to do is you're going to put out the task cards, you're going to have the tokens there in the center of the table, you're going to deal out the full deck of the full cards, like the large cards, the, the soup cards. Now... No matter how many players, you always deal with the full deck. Then everyone's going to look at their hand, and whoever has the number four rocket card becomes the commander, and they take a standee for that to show that they're the commander. Then the commander is going to look at the tasks on the table and pick one to complete, um, one they think they're going to be able to do. Now, note you can't communicate a lot here. Like there, There is some limit to what you're allowed to communicate while drafting these. Then the player on their left is going to take a task, and the player on their left is going to take a task until they're all gone. No, because of this, depending on your player count and how many tasks there are to complete, some players may have more than one to do on a mission. Now, the actual tasks are completed when the player who has the task in front of them wins a trick containing the card or cards in front of them that match on their task cards. Now, the task card is then flipped over when this happens, and if players are able to flip over all their tasks and the players complete the mission and win. Now, if at any point you can't win, uh, due to like someone taking the wrong trick or something getting taken before another thing, or the fact you know the nine's already gone or whatever, you lose the mission. Now, when you win, you're assumed you'll move on to the next mission, and if you fail, it's assumed you'll retry the same mission. So failing can happen the first time around if someone has made a mistake or isn't paying attention, or it can come right down to the wire mm. and no one is quite sure if you'll win that round or not right up until that very last card played. Yes, and this is also why I mentioned by the gameplay length is so variable because you could have seven missions where all the players, you get all that set up and then you play and then you screw something up the first round. And the game's over. You're done. You've played your entire round of the crew in less than five minutes. Now, I, I, we mentioned multiple times the trick-taking game. This is a standard trick-taking game. All standard trick-taking rules apply. The commander starts off with the lead. They choose any of their cards to play. Significant follow players must follow the lead and play a card from their hand of the same suit. If a player doesn't have any cards of the suit that was led, they can play it on any card known as playing your off card. The trick is then won by the player who played the highest number of the card suit led. Now, each suit has one of each of cards numbered one to nine, and there are four suits. Now, in addition, there are the rockets I mentioned a couple times. These are only numbered one to four. These are trump cards. The trump never changes in this game. It's always rockets. A trump card will take any trick it's played on, regardless of what suit was initially led. And if more than one trump is played in a single trick, the highest trump card wins the entire hand. And we've talked plenty about many different trick-taking games here on the show, as they are a favorite of ours to play. Yeah, we, we're in the Midwest, so we play trick-taking games. We, we have a whole episode where we talk about the regionality of trick-taking games that you can catch on the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Now, all of this, I gotta admit, like, I, I played, so I know better. It sounds pretty simple, right? Uh, but that's where these communication rules come in. What makes the crew a challenge is that during the game, you can't talk about your cards at all. Like, you can't mention what suits you have, any number, if it looks good, if it looks bad. You're not even supposed to groan when someone takes something you thought you were going to win. You're not allowed to talk about numbers. There is no table talk allowed during a round of the crew. Sort of. What every player does have, though, is a way to communicate without talking. Everyone has a communication token, and once per game, at the start of a trick, before any cards are played, note a trick, not a whole hand. It could be like your third trick in. 
you can use your communication token to do this you're going to take one of your cards put it face up on the table and you're going to put your token on it and where you put your token communicates something to the other players it's at the top of the card it says this is my highest number in the suit if it's in the middle of the card it says this is my only card of this suit and if it's at the bottom of the card it says this is my lowest card of this suit now you can only do this once per turn and there's a little thing where you put this like blank card into your hand so you remember that your your things there but that's a little fiddly. So this is it. That's that's the only way to communicate. Now some missions may restrict this further. And missions can actually other do other things too to mess with you like uh, including who to gets task tokens like there's at least one mission where the captain gives them out special rules for tricks just for that mission like someone has to win a trick with a one or passing and drawing cards. One of the missions I saw sounded fascinating. I haven't gotten to this one myself, that after your first trick, you then get a random card from the player on your left. And I'm like, whoa, okay, that would mess everyone up. Yeah, so unlike most trick-taking games, where you can, to some degree, play on automatic, uh, this game requires a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Misunderstanding one task or getting the wrong or the order wrong or any number of tiny lapses in concentration can end around very swiftly. Oh, there are so many times I played the crew um, and played a card or clicked a card and went, oh, that, why, th th well, yep. why did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> now, there is a little bit of salvation. If your group is having a hard time with suspicion... Uh, specifics. I can't say specific. Anytime your group's having a hard time with a specific mission, you also have the option at the very start of the round, once all cards are dealt, but before anyone has even discussed strategy or taken any task, to use what's called the distress signal. This is we're out in space and we send, we need help from Earth. When you do this, you flip the distress token over. Uh, you're going to go into your logbook right away and show that you used it because there is a penalty for using this. Then all players must pass one non-rocket card to an adjacent player. Now, the group as a whole decides if this is going to the left or the right, and all players are going to go the same direction, so everyone has the same amount of cards. While this, seem while seemingly simple, this is a huge benefit mm -hmm. to the round. Yeah, because not only do you now know what one person to your left has, the person next to you knows what you have. Plus, it's a good way to, for anyone who knows trick-taking, void yourself of a suit. And which is always great in most of these games, unless you're playing one of the missions where you need to take all the tricks. And there's always more to it. Now, while there's no like in game penalty during the round, you use the distress to no big deal. What it does is impact your overall mission score, which is something I haven't mentioned yet. There is a scoring system. At the end of each mission, you're meant to record in the provided mission logbook, or I would go online and get a PDF and print it out so you don't write in your game book, but that's your choice, how you did. How many attempts it took your group to complete the mission and whether or not you used the distress signal. Now, once you've completed all 50 missions, you're meant to add up these scores and then you get ranked on how good your crew is. So, we, having only played on Board Game Arena, I had no idea that there was any <laughs> scoring. I assumed it was just try and complete all, you know, successfully complete all 50. <laughs> no, there, there is, a, there is a, a scoring system. And as I've mentioned in other co-op game reviews i i guess I, I don't personally see the need for scoring i guess it's a way to compare yourself with other groups if i had multiple game groups it would be interesting if i played with like my monday night group and then i also played say at the cg realm a friendly local game store in windsor while we're checking out you can um and then compared which group did better so i guess i can kind of see it i can see it more in this than some other uh cooperative card games now in addition to this once you finish it right you've done all 50 missions as i mentioned earlier you can always go back and start over because like I said, this game i swear infinite replayability like the odds of you getting the exact same hands the exact same time with the exact same task to the exact same people are so slim you can go back and play any of it starting from the beginning or just go play your favorite missions if you really like the one where the captain decides who's sick and then that player has to take no tricks play that over and over again in addition to this, there are a number of official and fan-created missions that can be easily found online. Uh, one of the popular UK magazines actually has a whole set of, like, a, a second campaign in it. Now, in addition to these rules, there are special rules for playing with only two players. And technically, the five-player actually does have a small variant with it, but it's basically the same. It's how it has to do with who gets to draft the tricks or the, the tasks. The two-player, though, is a significant change. 
So the way this does this is the crew adds a third ghost player, um, which they, an AI player, which they call Jarvis, which I, I don't know if that's a Marvel shout out, but it sounds like one to me. Maybe not. Maybe the Marvel shout out is probably a shout out to some space mission or something. I don't know. Not what I know. But anyway, you have an AI called Jarvis. And when setting up each round, you're going to deal Jarvis a hand. But this is done differently. Jarvis's hand, you have to shuffle all the cards, pull out the rockets, and you're going to put seven cards face down and then seven cards face up on top of them. Now, while playing through a mission, the commander controls Jarvis, who acts like any other player. Like, like the Jarvis is assigned pass, they take turns in clockwise order. It's just that the commander chooses which cards Jarvis plays. And then when you play a card, you're going to reveal the card underneath, right? So you get to see those seven hidden cards. So I, I know you're not a huge fan of, of variant rules for player counts, um, but I mean, you just don't get a two-player game of this without it, this, right? No, as I mean, far as I could tell, like, I, I don't think you could, it, I don't know. I, I, we never tried. <laughs> it gave us the variant. We used the variant. It, it, it works well enough. Overall, uh, like the crew is just well done. Like, like it won a ton of awards, right? And, and it deserved every single one. This is an expertly designed and balanced game. It takes trick-taking, like really basic trick-taking. It's not even like weird trick-taking with six trumps or anything like that. This is like pretty much pure trick-taking with just adding the new element of certain people have to take certain tricks at certain times. That is really cool. And and so you have this, this like new way to do trick-taking that I found very engaging. Like Sean said, you engaging in the way that you have to pay attention. You are focused on this game while playing. And we have proven that if you're also chatting in Discord while playing, you tend to make mistakes. I think this is a great game for players familiar with trick-taking games in general. I also think, though, that it's very accessible to newcomers who may not know trick-taking due to the slow addition of rules in the mission system. The fact you only have to take one trick, like that's pretty simple to teach. Having to teach that for your one play like, like I, I almost want to use the first mission of the crew to teach someone to play a trick-taking game before, say, we go play Gorus Maximus, just to get that basic concept. I also dig the fact there's a story. Like, I can't think of really any other traditional card game that actually like, tells an ongoing story and an adventure and feels like a campaign. Like, sure, the, the Fox in the Forest has this fairy tale theme and a story about it, but you don't really feel like you're doing anything. It's just background. And I admit, it doesn't feel like I'm fixing a space station either, but like the story is baked into the mechanics. So for here's an example. In one mission, one of the crew members is tasked with doing repairs on your ship. So the main game mechanic to represent is that player can't use their communication token because they're busy. And I think that's really cool. Like, like to me, that's a, that's a pretty good integration of theme. It's not the best I've seen, but in a trick-taking game. Now in another mission, one of the crew members is sick. I mentioned this one earlier. Well, that member can't take any tricks because if they take any tricks, they infect the rest of the crew. And again, like that's that's a nice thematic tie-in to me. And and well, again, the story is notably missing in the online implementations. It's not really missed. It's still a solid trick-taking yeah. game with all these variants, uh, even if you don't understand the story behind them. Yeah, you definitely don't need the story, but I like the fact that it adds something. Yeah. And again, it ties together a lot better than you'd expect. Now, I do have to say, I Sean's only played the online version. I own a copy of the game and I've played it uh, a number of times. And it can be a bit fiddly, especially at the start of each round. Like, you got to deal out all the cards. You got to shuffle that. And then you got to go look up a mission in a paper book and find where you last left off. Then you got to look at it to figure out what the tasks are. So then you got to shuffle the task cards. You got to deal out more cards. And then you got to find the right tokens to put on those cards. And then everyone's got to sit back and got to discuss about who's going to take the task tokens. And you got to physically put them in front of you. Like, there's, it's just fiddly. There's a lot of stuff going on. That's a lot of setup for what honestly can be a round of a game that's over in one trick. Like, oh, someone screwed up. Then you got to do it again. It's not like you then put the same task tokens back to the middle and try again. No, you're supposed to, I guess you could, but you're supposed to wipe it. You're then going to re-grab all the cards. You're going to reshuffle the decks. You're going to reshuffle the tasks. You won't have to look it up in the book again, at least. You know that much, but it's just, it's fiddly. There's a lot of stuff you got to do. And two players, it's worse because now there's Jarvis. And not only do you have to deal with Jarvis's hand, but you have to do it with a, a unique deck with no... 
uh, rockets in it. So you deal out, you shuffle the cards with no rockets. You deal out Jarvis's hand. Now you reshuffle the cards with the rockets in. Then you deal those to the players. And then you still got to do all the other stuff. You got to get your tasks and your tokens. And you got to decide who gets them. Like that's a lot of shuffling for what ends up being very quick, especially at two players. Like the game's even quicker at two players. So even if you win, you're not looking at a long experience. And I found this really stuck out because my first gameplay experiences with the crew were online playing on board game arena. Now on board game arena, the software does all of this, right? It does all the shuffling. It does the token placing. It tracks their communication tokens, everything. Now I admit, I love the feel of real cards in my hand. I like the feeling of shuffling and I prefer to play games face to face, but there are times I was playing the crew where I was like, man, I kind of want to go upstairs online and play. You know what? I could see this and, and, and I think they could really benefit from implementing this as a helper app. So you still have to shuffle your player cards, your one to nine and, and, and Trump and deal that out. But the task setup, the Hobbit cards mm-hmm. and task layout could be done on, a, on, a, on a, by an app on the table um, and take away a whole lot. All you need to do is tell it what mission you were doing and it could shuffle and, 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 yeah. and list some tasks out in front of you. And, and really cut down the, the sort of, you know, pain of, of setting up each round. Uh, what I'd even prefer more is if everyone could have their app on their personal phone and they put it out in front of them where their tasks would be. And yeah. just that way you can easily look at what everyone has. Yeah, I can totally see that. Now, going back to the two-player game. Well, it works. I, it, it works rather well. I got to say, it just wasn't as much fun as playing with more players. Uh, and then another thing Deanna notes that due to the lack of table talk, this is not a good date night game because you want to chat on date night and you want to interact. And this is more just staring at your cards and playing them. So uh, I, I got to say, if, if I'm looking for a two player trick taking game, I'm not grabbing the crew. Sorry to say Cosmos. Um, I would be going to grab something else like the Fox in the forest or the Fox in the forest duet. So, so Sorry for it, but yeah, I, 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 this is one of those. I get that they put a two player on, but I, I would say the crew is a three to six player game. Yeah. Sometimes it's best to just let a game soar at what it was designed for and not try to wrestle it into other player counts, even though I realize that marketing PR often will People are probably want push it. you to get more player counts on the box. If this came out without saying two to six on the box, there'd be people out there screaming, why can't I play a two player? So I get it, but like I said, this isn't the one I'm going to choose with only two of us. Now, what really isn't evident when hearing about this game? And honestly, when first playing the first couple missions, is how dang hard it can be playing a trick-taking game where specific people need to take specific tricks. Like just saying that specific people have to take specific tricks. That sounds easy, right? So you're you're playing you're playing euchre and you're bidding on how many tricks your team's going to take. This should be easy to do. Oh, it is not. It is not at all. Uh, this game is way harder than you would think, especially with the communication restrictions. Um, and then added to that, there is the randomness factor, which is going to come up in any card game. But the randomness of the task deck can really adjust the difficulty of a given mission. Now, I'm. I I don't know. I'm almost certain that every possible combination is winnable during a game of the crew. I think managing this is certain cards is going to be definitely easier than others. Like, for example, if you need to take a one in a trick and you're the one holding that card and you have other numbers in that suit, that is hard to take that trick. On the opposite side, though, having a nine in a trick when you're holding the nine, oh, I need a nine yellow. I've got the nine yellow. Well, that's simple enough. You lead the nine yellow, <laughs> like done. I get that trick. As long as one of the other players doesn't have no yellows and plays a rocket, but I, they would probably realize what you're trying to do because they have you have in front of you a card that says you need the nine yellow. So, so like it really does affect it. And I gotta say, like it, it's it's a card game. Of course, there's randomness in the factor. So, it's it's definitely something that some players may not like this randomness. But in that case, they're probably not looking at trick taking games anyway. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm not sure that it's completely winnable. Uh, my gut feeling is that certain combinations of task and deal, uh, as well as who the mission leader position was, could result in unwinnable conditions. Uh, it's yeah. probably rare, but I to, to say that it's it's always winnable, I, I have suspicions. 
See, I, I don't know. I'm thinking it's always winnable, but very unlikely unless you had open playing open information. Like if all the cards were face up, the, the puzzle is always there to get it to play the cards in the right order. But the odds are your group doing that when they don't know what that order. I don't know. This, this might be worth Googling once we're done the review because the game's been out long enough. Someone's probably right. done the math to figure out if it's always winnable. I, I feels like it is. I hope like they, that's one of the things i don't like about some other cooperative games is that you can get on win, winnable situations where there's nothing your group can do to win right. i would hope that everything's winnable it definitely to me feels like like i said the odds may be slim but so overall thoughts uh the crew quest for planet nine is honestly one of the best tricking games i've ever played and i am a long time fan of trick taking games like going back to hearts and spades and diamonds and euchre and i i have played i not all of them i'm sure but a a large number of trick taking games wizard five crowns um and then uh, other modern ones like uh goris maximus and macaron this game takes like like basic trick taking right like it, it's very pure trump never changes it, it takes the basics of of trick taking and does something new and cool with it in addition to this this is one of the best co-op games i own a uh, big part of that of course is the restrictions on communication like it pretty much eliminates any quarterbacking but yet despite the lack of communications you really need to work together to win this and being able to, to, to play well, right, and, and, and follow the right lead and know that because this person led this, they probably mean this. Like, that aspect of it, I really like. And I personally really appreciate the theme and story. I, I think that's really neat. I like that it's actually tied to the mechanics in some of the missions. Now, I got to admit, the setup for each hand can be a bit fiddly, but I think the fiddliness is worth it. Every round I played of the crew is engaging and fun, even if we lose. I agree. Now, while I haven't had a deal with the fiddliness of the physical components, the online play I've taken part in has been fantastic every single time. Mm. Though, if you are playing online, you want to note, never play turn-based. <laughs> Real-time only. But that's really true for almost all trick-taking games. Yeah, if, you, if you're playing turn-based, you better be taking lots of notes, because you're not going to remember who played what and what they played at what time and what they might have alluded to by that play. Yeah, it's just not that you, you play that one real time. I If you like trick-taking games, I'm sorry, go buy it. Get get the crew. Go online. Order it right now. Call your FLGS. Ask them to get you in a copy of, of Quest for Planet Nine. Like, seriously, this is a great trick-taking game. Now, if you like cooperative games, that's another good reason. Grab the crew. If you dig co-ops, it's a great co-op. Now, if you're not familiar with trick-taking games, oh, I don't know. Because playing the crew would be kind of like diving into the deep end. But then the game kind of gives you floaties because you get the real slow progression and onboarding of the early missions. I, you might still want to check it out, but I do think this is definitely geared towards players who have trick-taking experience. Uh, if you're not a fan of trick-taking games, I you know what? I might want to try this one. It does something very different. Like uh, this might be the thing that wins you over and go, oh, wait, there's more to trick-taking games than I thought. Now, again, I'm not going to say rush out and buy it, but maybe do a demo, see if your friend's got a copy, try it out. Uh, same goes for people who don't like cooperative games because the crew does things differently and feels very different from your standard co-op games like, say, Pandemic or Forbidden Island. And again, I think it's worth giving a shot. Like Again, so do a demo day. I'm pretty sure Cosmos has this. Uh, you go on Board Game Arena and try it. Yep. The crew's one of those games I'm really close to saying everyone should own this one. Everyone should just have a copy of the crew. But I know there's people out there that despise randomness in any card game or dice game or absolutely hate tricking games, trick-taking games, or refuse to play co-ops. Now, personally, I think those players may be missing out, but to each their own. Not every game is for everyone, and that's a beautiful thing. Well, we are done talking about The Crew here. You can and should check out our The Crew review over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. We're going to move on. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. All right, so I mentioned this at the top of the show. I've been really busy the last couple of days and weeks, and that I haven't really had time for any in-person gaming. Now, all I got this time are a couple board game arena games, two of which I'm going to bring up quickly. 
Now, first up, we finally finished that game of Terra Mystica. We talked about a couple weeks ago. This was my best game yet. Um, I really dig the Darklings. I had a lot of fun with those. And you did surprisingly well as well. Indeed. I, the Giants worked out really well for me. And I, and I know some people have, have said they didn't like those, but worked for me. Now, second, uh, we're lap one into my second full game of Rallyman GT. And uh, the last game was fun. I made some mistakes due to not quite understanding the rules of the game, uh, specifically the penalties for wiping out. And I didn't realize I was missing red and green dice that were there at the start of the game. And um, even more importantly, what exactly pitting does and what I should be doing in the pits. Like I shouldn't be changing my tires when the weather hasn't changed. Uh, now that I got a better grasp of what's going on, I think this game's going much better. So at this point, I don't know if anyone's kept enough catching purple again though that's how the last game started off too yeah I'm, i mean i'm i'm there's a potential uh if they make one slip up i can probably get up to them i don't know yeah. if i can pass them if they only make one mistake but uh i i am hot on their tail so right. i'm hoping i am definitely playing a lot more conservative <laughs> that is one of the things i'm doing now I'm that like, last oh. game i had i i was i mean last game was the worst game i have ever had <laughs> oh, wow. of that so uh, the rest of it is not worth talking about. More Race for the Galaxy, Seven Wonders, etc. Um, though I think you and D played a game of Clans of Caledonia, didn't you? Yeah, we uh, we actually you would you would uh, you weren't feeling well and just sort of didn't want to deal with it. Yeah. So D and I played in like one night uh, a game of uh, Clans of Caledonia, and uh, that was you know it was really fun. I, I this is the first time I've done it two player. Yeah, uh, and it was a nice uh, balance, and because we were almost real time. Uh, it played really quickly and, nice. and it's, it's amazing. I didn't think you could get through the game as quickly as we did. Um, and that yeah, was, that's that was, a solid two player experience. I was yeah. surprised by that. The first time I played it was two player. Uh, and then, uh, after I played it for myself at your house, after we did the review of rogue book, uh, I decided it was good enough and I picked it up on pre-order, uh, and I'm, I'm playing with the demo. It's not perfect. Uh, and there are some frustrations that come out there, but it's really got some legs to it. Uh, mm -hmm. I keep pulling it open once or twice a day, despite any of those little frustrations. So it's definitely, uh, you know, something that's going to hang around for a while. Yeah, I, I am still digging that game. I'm not playing it as much as you are, but I do pop it on now and then. Yep. Uh, general lack of time for everything is why I'm really not getting to it. Yep. Uh, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? So I, I don't know. <laughs> I have no clue. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think a year of quarantine has really been getting to me lately. I just, I, I honestly don't know. So Deanna is celebrating her birthday this weekend. So happy birthday to Deanna. Um, this may lead to some tabletop gaming. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't tell you exactly what, but I know Deanna is not going to want to learn anything new because that is something she's not a fan of. So I, I could see some two-player trick-taking games come up that aren't the crew, maybe some Azul, we'll see. Um, I am really hoping I can spend more time away from this computer right here in this desk um, and hopefully get some form of gaming in, uh, whether that's with the kids or not, but we'll see. Um, if I do have some free time, I also have unboxings to do. I got stuff I got for my birthday that I'm like super hyped to play and I'm all excited about. Like I, they were on my wish list for a reason and I, I'm being very good and I'm leaving them so I can unbox them. And so you see what I do for you folks? <laughs> like, like these are birthday games I want to play. I can play Great Western Trail tomorrow, but I have to, I, I'm going to do an unboxing. I will, I will share it with everyone. Well, now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Uh, first, Sean P. Kelly of the Gaming and BS podcast, which you can watch live here on Twitch, Monday nights, 9 p.m., as well as some actual plays and encounter building and other stuff on weekends. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark, join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games, game mastering at twitch.tv slash misdirectedmark. Which reminds me, actually, the gaming and BS, I should put in the thing, it's like gaming underscore and underscore BS, if I remember, because there is another gaming and BS that is not them. Oh. Which is kind of interesting that there are two on Twitch. It, it's the one with the underscores. <laughs> and finally, Papa Swick, Joe Swick, thank you very much for your support. Well, that was the double bell.
That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our well- website at tabletopbellhop.com and find the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast on your podcatcher of choice. And sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we've been providing and would like to support our continued efforts and keep us live and on the air, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the Pento Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and, and game, game on. on.